Okay, good morning everybody. If you're part of the Wood for Good conference, could I ask you to come and take your seats? That would be great. All very socially distanced.
Thank you. Roll up, roll up. Last takers for seats. Okay. So, welcome everybody to our Read for Good conference this morning. This is our first conference in about two years, so we hope everything's going to go as smoothly as possible, uh, but forgive us if there's any wee glitches along the way. Um, and that's not just me, that's from the other speakers and everybody else here too. Um, I'm Lucy Black, I'm Impact Director here at Construction Scotland Innovation Centre, and I'm going to be your host for today. So before our Chief Exec, Stephen Good, um, opens the conference, I'd just like to cover off some general housekeeping points. Please put your phones on silent. I was attending a conference yesterday and somebody was very embarrassed for about five minutes as he couldn't find the off switch on his. Um, toilets can be found right here, just at the yellow block there, and there's others out in the reception area. If you could also switch the wee sign to occupied when you're in, that would be great. Please remember to wear your face covering when you're walking around. Um, we're in a factory setting, which I've clearly forgotten in this dress, which isn't the warmest. Um, so if you're feeling cold, we've got a few blankets up the back, um, so you can help yourself. I might need to give a wee signal to throw one to me eventually. Um, we should be aware that this event is being live streamed on our b at cop 26 org forward slash live streaming and we will be taking photographs feel free to post on social media in fact the more the better make sure you tag um, construction scotland innovation center and our event website b hyphen at hyphen cop 26.org but we would be grateful if you could actually avoid taking photos of the blue thermal bonding line as much as possible too and a quick reminder of our programme. Um, the morning session, we've got a short comfort break. It's not a coffee break, a comfort break at 11.45. Lunch will be served between half past 12 and half past one. And that will be provided in the cafe, which is just outside the factory uh, on the left. And the conference part finishes at 3.30 today, but I hope most of you are then signed up for some of our timber tours at that point. So the other thing just to mention before I close off and welcome Stephen is to say that we're going to be running a few polls this morning. We'll be using Slido. So if you want to um, uh, download Slido, please. Slido.com, Helen, is it? Yeah. Um, and our event code is 803716. I'll repeat that each time we do a Slido. Um, so look out for these. There'll be three of these. And we'll also be taking audience questions at different points. So we'd really, like, really, really like to hear you, as with those that are joining us uh, virtually through the live streaming, and just participate as much as possible. So I'll hand over to Stephen now. Mr. Good, if you'd like to come up, just to say a few words. Thank you, Lucy. Morning, everybody. I'm going to do the proverbial, right? Everyone's on stage, so everybody smile. <laughs> This is the first, as Lucy says, this is the first one we've done in ages, so everybody having a good time so far? Give us a wave and a cheer. <laughs> Brilliant. You did the wave but well. <laughs> um, thank you, uh, Lucy, and everybody for being here today. Yes, my name's Stephen Good. Um, I am Chief Executive at Construction Scotland Innovation Centre, and it is my immense pleasure to welcome you all here today for um, what Lucy said, uh, our first event in, in nearly 20 months, which... Um, I guess in the in the sort of darker moments of the last uh, 20 months or so, we weren't quite sure whether we would uh, we would ever do this again. So uh, it's an immense privilege to welcome you all here today, uh, and hopefully experience um, COP26 uh, in, in our, uh, our own unique um, setting. Which uh, hopefully, if, if you do need the blankets, they're at the back. But hopefully, it gets a bit warmer during the, the course of today. But um, but you're all very welcome, and brilliant to see everybody uh, in person uh, rather than on a, a screen, which is a, a fantastic step in the right direction. Um, as Lucy said, um, we're not entirely back to normal, so we are a bit more spaced out than, uh, than, than normal. Um, and I, I mean that in a physical sense. Some of the folk that have been involved in pulling everything together are, are a bit more spaced out in every sense, I think, at the moment. But um, we've managed to pull it off um, so far. Um, and what an opportunity COP26 presents, I think, for the built environment to showcase some of the wonderful things um, that we are doing and will continue to do to help tackle the climate crisis. Um, 
The eyes are on Scotland, uh, the eyes are on Glasgow, and, and for today the eyes are on our little corner of, uh, of Blantyre here. Um, and I think our message is certainly one of, of optimism, coptimism, I suppose, if you want to get into that um, good cop, bad cop thing that I'm sure we'll hear lots of over the next couple of weeks. Um, 12 miles away in Glasgow, leaders, world leaders will be talking about um, what needs to be done, um, and they'll be discussing what action looks like. Um, what you get the chance to see today is what is actually already happening, what some of the, um, the amazing projects that are tackling um, climate crisis in, in our own way, taking the built environment forward, looking at how we um, can build a, a more regenerative, a more sustainable, a more recyclable, um, a more... Uh, a more um, ecological future, I suppose, and how the built environment can sit right at the heart of all of that. Um, so really excited to be able to um, showcase uh, some of the amazing work that the partners we've been supporting over the last couple of years actually have been developing. Um, I'll let you have a, a, a flavour of what that looks like today. Um, I do need to say a couple of quick thank yous, um, and firstly a special thank you to the team at Wood for Good, who are our sponsors for this event today. Um, as many of you know, uh, Wood for Good is the timber industry campaign promoting the use of timber in design and construction. Um, and we have, uh, I think, gone out of our way to make sure that that's um, front and foremost in a lot of the work that we've been supporting um, today and is, is on show. So uh, a huge thank you uh, to the team at Wood for Good. I also need to say a thank you to the other partners that have been um, instrumental in helping us get here today, uh, supporting in a whole variety of different ways. Um, so they include, in no particular order, the team at Synergy, the team at Ecosystems Technologies, Scottish Forestry, Cities for Forests, CONFOR, Edinburgh Napier University, NMITE, the American Hardwood Export Council, Timber Development UK, the UK Government's Department for Education, Scottish Government, Scottish Funding Council, Scottish Enterprise and Highlands and Islands Enterprise, and Innovate UK, who have supported a number of the projects that you'll see here today. Um, before I hand back over to Lucy and we go on with the, the meat of the, the programme today, uh, I've got one final thank you to say, uh, and that's to our team at CSIC who have done an amazing job. Um, for, for those of you that don't know, we, we had a, a, fairly, um, a fairly mild COP26 planned, I think, by our standards anyway. Um, and five weeks ago, uh, one of the partners that we were working with who was going to be developing a site in Glasgow to exhibit all of the, the buildings and installations that you see here today uh, had some unfortunate change of direction, which meant that wasn't possible. Uh, and we had two options at that point. One option was to um, accept that the game was, the game was off, um, we'd have to regroup. Um, and uh, the other option was we could step in uh, and um, make that happen here. And I think in the five weeks that we managed to give ourselves uh, to do it, the team have done a fantastic job, um, where others have taken probably 18 months or so to plan for what was coming. So thank you, I was just about to say, to all the team in the orange vests and the supporters and everybody else that's helped. Um, brilliant, what a team, um, fantastic. Um, and uh, yeah, couldn't, couldn't be prouder of what we've been able to achieve in such a short, uh, short space of time. So I hope you enjoy yourselves today. I hope you get a lot from it. I'm really looking forward to um, the excellent speakers that we have, who I think will, uh, I hope, inspire and delight us, um, perhaps challenge us. I hope you, as an audience, will get involved and ask questions. Uh, and, and Lucy's got time set aside to make sure we do that with all of the speakers. So really looking forward to an engaging, um, informative and uh, ex experience that we all take something away from that gives us all a hope, hopefully an exciting day today uh, and I hope you all have a great COP26. Um, thank you very much indeed. Lucy, back over to you. Okay, just before I welcome our first official speaker, um, I'll give you the Wi-Fi code. Somebody was uh, intimating that to me so that you can use your Slido comfortably. So it's IC, all lowercase for Innovation Centre, IC Visitor. All one word all lowercase. Okay, so I'm now delighted to welcome our first speaker. Come on up. Um, Andrew Wach, who's founder of Wach Thistleton Architects. So Andrew is a founding director of Wach Thistleton Architects, whose core ethos of the practice is to design and construct sustainable and very beautiful buildings. His passion for architecture extends beyond the physical practice to a wide-ranging research in sustainable construction. He's won the Reba President's Medal in 2010, and he continues to write, teach, and lecture at any opportunity, one of which is today. Andrew's an internationally sought-after speaker. He writes for numerous industry publications, and he teaches at the world's best architecture schools. He's also an active member of various organisations committed to a sustainable world. 
And finally, Andrew is a visiting professor of architecture at the University of Arkansas. And I so hope, Andrew, you're going to add Construction Scotland Innovation Centre speaker to this big list. <laughs> so come on up and tell us about your future made from wood. Thanks very much. Thanks, Lucy. Um, I've never heard that, um, that list of accolades before. That's quite... Um, so good morning, everybody. Um, it's great to be here, to see, um, to actually be in the UK and look around and see this much engineered timber, this much innovation at close hand is really exciting. So very pleased to be here. Um, I'm just going to give you a whistle-stop tour through a 20-year career. Um, so if I talk too quickly, I'm going to do so in order to make sure there's time for questions at the end. So this is us. We're Worth Islington Architects. And we are passionate as a practice about the implications of the work that we do in terms of climate change and sustainability. Um, and that has been an emerging kind of ethos of the practice over the last 20 years. And 20 years ago, uh, we, well, 2000, it's not quite 20 years ago, is it? 19 years ago. <laughs> Make them. Um, we built the first CLT building in the UK. We had no idea that that's what we were doing. Um, and, but we were very uh, excited about ideas around prefabrication and thinking about um, how we could use low carbon materials. There wasn't really anything talked about in terms of embodied carbon that we knew, or the idea of upfront carbon was, was still something that hadn't really been kind of um, finalized or discussed or, you know, was a was no more than a concept at the time. But as a practice, we had an idea that actually we should start thinking about sustainability not only in terms of energy use, but also of the building materials that we were using and how we could do that, not in a kind of, not in a peripheral sense, so not kind of, uh, not kind of bird watching centers in Norfolk kind of sense although they're great and there's some lovely ones. But the idea that we would actually be a mainstream practice and that we would involve ourselves with um, commercial residential developers looking at low carbon construction materials. And so we, we happened to come across uh, this Austrian guy sitting on his own in the corner of this sort of kind of hippie exhibition full of hempcrete and sheep's wool insulation. And there he was with a lump of CLT in about 2002 and we were just starstruck. And then we built this little building, about 40 square meters, and I sat on my bike and watched them build it in just a couple of hours, millimeter perfect, two people, cordless screwdrivers, and the whole building went together. It's like a kind of one-to-one -one model. There it is, it was really exciting. And from that moment on, I was taken. And um, so that's what we've continued to do since then. And for me, this isn't just about low carbon. Um, it's not just about replacing concrete and steel, which is what we need to do. We need to reduce within the next uh, nine years, we need to reduce the amount of concrete that we use in this country by more than 50% just to meet our current commitments. That's without inventing anything amazing. But that's not going to happen. So we need to reduce the amount of concrete and steel we use, concrete specifically, by 50%. So if you think, how are we going to do that as a, as a society when we need a lot of concrete for infrastructure, for foundations, we need to be replacing concrete and steel in the buildings that we build. And so we see engineered timber as the only viable solution the only viable replacement for that. And in 2008, we got an opportunity to build a project, um, <clears throat> which is nine stories, 29 apartments, all in cross-laminated timber. And this really gave us the kind of, the sort of, I think the, the sort of the, the inspiration, the initiative, the kind of kickstart to really believe that this was a, a possible kind of and viable alternative to concrete and steel. And one of the things that we've done with, with this project and with, and, with, and with our projects subsequently is to keep things very simple. You can see here just CLT, three inch galvanized shelf brackets, five inch screws, little plastic tags on the ceiling to run the, to run the electrics and the, and, the, um, uh, and the services through. And um, we built, tw four people built the entire structure of this building in 27 days. So incredibly fast very lightweight, weighs about 20% of a reinforced concrete building, um, fewer deliveries, an 80% reduction in traffic, and, 
and very quiet. So we're about nine meters away from an adjacent building. No, no complaints, no problems, because the whole thing is going together with cordless screwdrivers and, uh, and precision. So in 2009, we made a conscious decision as a practice. We had a lot of interest in the building, a lot more than we realized, because we were just kind of like beavering away. That's a kind of appropriate expression, but beavering away in the corner um, on, a sort of, on our fascination with this material and looked up and looked around and realized that there was a lot of interest in what we were doing. And so we decided at that point as a practice that we would be completely open source about everything that we do. So we wrote this book, which um, is still available on Amazon. I think I get about 20p if you buy one. So, um, <clears throat> and in this book, we put all the drawings, we put all the, all, the succeed, all, the, all the failures, all the kind of like where we'd succeeded, you know, and we really tried to be as open as we possibly could and, sub and have done since then, um, been very open source about the materials and, uh, and, our, um, uh, and our experiences since then. Um, this is <clears throat> our largest built project to date. This is 17,000 square meters, uh, 10 stories tall in Dalston in North London, and 121 apartments. If we'd built that of concrete, it would have been 10,000 tons of concrete, about 900 deliveries of concrete to site. Um, but in timber, less than 2,000 tons, about 2,435 trees which is about, for the 800 people that live and work in the building, that's about three trees per person in the building. So very efficient, very lightweight. The entire structure took four months to build. <clears throat> Two teams of four people took four months. Um, and you can see, incredibly fast. By the time the train has gone past, the building is finished. And then we wrote, we've, um, since then, um, we're not the only people building in cross-laminated timber, in engineered timber in the UK. So we have about 600 buildings across the UK made from engineered timber. And in 2018, we did a project for the US Department of Agriculture um, where, we, uh, where we spoke to a lot of the developers, architects, contractors, engineers involved in those buildings. And we put together a book of 100 projects in the UK, which is full of drawings and interviews, and then kind of assimilated information which runs across different sectors. So residential, commercial, education, etc. And this is still available for free online at thinkwood.com. Um, <clears throat> then in 2018, we built this factory with Vitsu um, in Leamington Spa. And this is a, an interesting project for us. This is the first project that we were ever, um, where we were ever asked to build a timber building. Um, all the other projects that we ever built in timber, and we've completed 26 CLT buildings now in the UK and France. And this was the first one where um, actually we were commissioned to build a building in timber. All the other buildings that we've built <laughs> before then, we had to persuade people that building them in timber was more cost efficient and faster than building them in concrete and steel. Um, <clears throat> so this building here is um, built from, uh, and the reason why I've showed it is because it, it's about um, thinking about where we are as a practice in terms of researching into different types of engineered timber. So this is using a softwood CLT on the outside of the building. And then on the inside, it's using a hardwood LVL. So using, rather than planks of timber, using veneers of timber, stacked up veneers, that form the beams and the columns of this building. And that, uh, those structural pieces are as strong as steel in cross-section. Um, and they provide, the beam across there is about 25 meters long and about 50 centimeters deep. So incredibly strong, um, incredibly rigid structure, which is then held together with this kind of external um, structural shell of the CLT. And you can see inside, I guess the other thing that, that this kind of project as well began to demonstrate to us was not only the kind of the speed, the ease, the accuracy of the construction process, but also that being inside one of these buildings where we have the opportunity here to expose the timber, that being inside one of these buildings also has a kind of health and well-being benefit as well to the people that uh, spend all day in that factory. Well, it was a factory, it's now a restaurant and a museum and a ballet school and a factory. Um, <clears throat> this is a project that we have currently on site at the moment in Shoreditch in East London, um, which is where most of our projects are because that's where I live. <laughs> and sort of lazily kind of building their own. So this is a 5,000 square meter office building using a similar sort of, um, of structural technology um, to the previous Vitsu project 
we are using here, you can see this is a couple of weeks ago on site here, so using the beach LVL as the structural frame and then using the softwood CLT as the floor slabs and the core. So the entire building is made from timber above ground, 5,000 square meters of office um, made from 100% timber. Oh, sorry, LVL, I should explain. So LVL is laminated veneer lumber. And the difference is, is that, is that cross-laminated timber is made from planks of timber. So planks that are laid out on a bed, like one of the ones behind you over there. And, <clears throat> and uh, then those planks are laid in perpendicular layers and with a, sprayed with adhesive. And LVL is a veneer. So you get the tree and you peel the tree. So with a beech tree, you peel that out and you might get about 100 meters of veneer out of that. Then you slice that veneer up and you stack that veneer. Four layers parallel, the fifth layer perpendicular. So it's both strong in that way, but it also has a cross grain, a cross grain strength as well. So it's very stable and very hard. Um, and as I said, as strong as steel in terms of its structural capacity. So what we do with this building is we use the LVL to take all the gravitational load and then we use the CLT to take all the shear forces in the building. So all the wind load in the building is taken by the CLT. So it's an incredibly strong, incredibly light building. Weighs about 20% of, uh, of an equivalent concrete frame building. Um, <clears throat> and in terms of the carbon in that structure, and I think it's very important to, you know, this is something that just in the last couple of years we've really began to get hold of as a practice, is this understanding of the actual, you know, being able to demonstrate the figures of these buildings, being able to demonstrate the kind of savings that we get by building buildings like this in timber rather than in concrete. In fact, if anybody's seen on the news, I was kind of like last night with my calculator on my phone looking at it, but if anybody's seen on the news recently this big plant in Iceland this multi-million dollar plant in Iceland that sucks up carbon dioxide from the air and stores it in the ground in Iceland. Well, the amount of carbon saved in this building by building it in timber rather than in concrete is equivalent to 50% of a year's worth of carbon sucking by that, by that machine in Iceland. So these, are, these, these projects make a big difference. These are not incremental. Um, uh, small benefits. These are big benefits. And the benefits of carbon the saving from embodied carbon rather than from operational carbon is that it happens right now. So you're making these savings right now when we really need them. Not over 60 years, which is how long operational carbon is counted. So you can see here that building that building in concrete would have been about 450 kilos per square meter of emissions, um, 265 in timber. But if you, count the, um, if you count the sequestered carbon, so the carbon within the timber itself, then actually you're down to uh, less than um, 70 kilos per square meter, which is an incredibly low number. And in fact, even in that number, about 40% of the carbon there is from the basement. As you can see here, looking at the carbon in the structure, that you take out the carbon from the basement here, and, uh, <clears throat> and you can see immediately that the amount of carbon savings. Even in a typical concrete frame building, uh, the amount of carbon that's used to create a basement rather than a typical floor is about five times the amount. So we need to stop building basements. <clears throat> Again, this is a really, you know, you can see what we've done here in terms of the detailing, how this building is put together. Um, all the steel uh, connections that connect the various pieces of timber together, those are fire protected by the timber structure itself. So we embed the steel within the timber to fire protect the steel. But very simple details as well, very kind of tectonic, uh, very, um, you know, very sort of uh, understood, legible form of construction. And we have a timber curtain wall, and then on the outside of the timber curtain wall, we have timber solar louvers protecting the glazing from the sun. And that's what it'll look like. There you go. Lots of hipsters in shortage. Um, our largest project currently is one that's a bit mired in planning at the moment, but in Bergen in Norway, it's uh, two and a half thousand homes in a primary school, community center, and it's floating on a lake in Bergen. And one of the reasons I want to show this project is because what we've begun to understand with this project is actually not how we just reduce our impact, but how we begin to try and make things better with our buildings. So um, 
just briefly, the, the, um, the way that the foundations on this building work is that they're full of oyster beds. And the oysters within the foundations that, that cling onto the foundations of the building filter the lake and help regenerate a lake that's been polluted for 50 years. Um, <clears throat> we're also building in Milan um, uh, with Lendlease. That's a 44,000 square meter office building completely prefabricated in timber. Um, Again, you can see very kind of like the, the interiors of these buildings, very pared back, really taking advantage and enjoying the natural materials. Um, <clears throat> so we went from, a, um, after the change in building regs in the UK, we went from a, uh, a, a, um, an architecture practice in the UK who built housing in the UK, and we're now an architecture practice who build offices in Europe. <laughs> but um, this is, a, this is a modular housing that we're doing for Swan Housing in, in, um, in East London. So looking just at the manufacturing process, you know, in terms of productivity in construction, productivity of the last 50 years in construction has gone down by about 20%. So we make buildings more slowly and more expensively than we did 50 years ago. So one of the things about we can help to cure that is to talk about the prefabrication. And prefabrication in CLT is a very straightforward thing to be able to do. So this is a building we have in, in East London, 65 affordable homes. Uh, socially rented homes in East London. And we've worked on design guides with them. Um, and also, so I want to talk to you, behind us over here, we have a, a structure that we built a couple of years ago for the American Hardwood Council, who came to us with an idea for us to build a sort of an, uh, a sculpture in the V&A uh, courtyard. But we don't really do sculptures as a practice. But they, this is here, and uh, this is some tulip wood that arrived here. And we made the tulip wood with the help of CSIC. Well, CSIC made the tulip wood with the help of us um, into, uh, into cross laminated timber. And we made these series of boxes that started as models here. And then you can see against that backdrop there, these were put together and then placed in the VA courtyard. We had, um, it was there for about three weeks. We had 150,000 people come and see it, apparently, and 1.5 million Instagram hits. So we began to, we got our message out. We began to be able to really talk about the opportunities of structural timber and what you can do, the variety that you can, the, of kind of architecture that you can create. And we've actually taken this down since then, re-exhibited it in a different form in Milan, then took it down, re-exhibited it in a different form in Madrid. Um, now it's here and in the Design Museum and in a couple of other places as well. So it's still going. Um, we're now, as a practice, about um, a third of our work is in research, a lot for the European Union, where we are researching different opportunities for timber over the 27 countries. Um, um, and that includes a research project that we're doing with uh, the Loudest Foundation built by Nature Fund in the UK, which is demonstrating that we can still build in timber in the UK within current building regulations. So this is a pre-warrantied uh, residential system for six-story buildings. Um, which is pre-approved by fire brigades, by insurers, and by warranty providers. And this will be released in, November, in December, beginning of December, and this is a completely open source set of information so that any other architects, clients, developers, contractors, etc., can take these drawings and build with them um, so that we can help to kickstart uh, net zero housing in the UK. Um, and that will come with very straightforward, simple sets of details like that. Now, this is why I'm, one of the things I'm really excited and passionate about at the moment is what we do with all the existing buildings that we have and how we can help regenerate those buildings, extend those buildings by using timber. So this is a project that we have in Amsterdam at the moment where we're using an existing eight-story concrete building to, um, to sort of be, if you like, the kind of... The, the, the kind of the structural heart of the building and then building a t new timber building around it um, using the concrete structure as the kind of like, as the sort of, um, to, to help with the wind loads. And then uh, another one which is a tower building uh, where we're putting two stories on top but we're actually able to add additional floor area around the outside of the building without, um, without affecting the existing foundations. So we're able to increase the size of that building, therefore make it viable to keep the existing building. So how can we use timber to regenerate, to um, extend the existing buildings that we have so that we avoid demolishing the buildings um, in our cities? Um, and that is my last slide, thank you. 
That is the number of, uh, that's the number of tree seeds that it took to grow the trees that built our first tall building. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sure you'll agree it's been great to hear from Andrew about the crucial role that timber plays in sustainable construction. And I think to also thank him for his openness throughout the years and sharing your experiences of um, engineered timber and mass timber. And I hope certainly we can increase the 600 UK um, mass timber buildings that currently exist. And we want more of them grown in homegrown Scottish timber as well. So Absolutely. I think you've been instrumental in helping to open up that opportunity. So um, we're running slightly over time, but we will um, give you a couple of minutes to ask any questions. Um, so if I can put it out to the audience, does anybody have any questions they would like to put to Andrew? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. oh, thank you. Um, so, it, it's um, is there a way around that? There, there is a way through it. Um, I think that the the research project that we're doing at the moment shows that you can build to six stories within current building regulations. Now, in the UK, still more than 75% of the housing that we build is six stories and below. So hopefully that will go some way to, to help um, reinvigorate the industry in terms of building in timber, because it is possible. I mean, the frustration is that the regulation should be there in the first place, you know, that there's been some kind of, you know, some pseudo common sense applied you know, to, to building regulations. When the Hackett report said, after Grenfell, the Hackett report said, don't change the building regulations, change the way in which they're regulated. And the one thing that happened was they changed the building regulations, but not the way they're regulated. So it's a little bit of a, unfortunately, kind of political knee-jerk um, reaction. Thank you. Anybody else? Daniel's running. Oh, here comes a tough one. <laughs> Hi, Andrew. That was amazing. Um, I'm wondering if, in your experience, uh, you've had examples where people have connected uh, through the, the users, connecting back to you or, or anyone in the, in the production uh, through the experience of the wood and even all the way back to the forest. Is there, has there been connections made between living in one of these buildings and new kinds of awareness about the environment, uh, curiosity, etc.? That's a nice question. Yeah, I think so. I think so. I mean, it kind of like, you know, we get people, we do get people who kind of, because most of our projects were built without people really being aware that they were made of timber. <laughs> you know, we've had to cover the timber up. So a lot of people didn't know, and then they've subsequently found out and then got in touch with us and asked us about it and got quite excited about the buildings that they had found themselves in. So that's nice, and we kind of like, you know, we did a scheme, uh, the Dolson Lane scheme that we did, which is a build to rent scheme, all covered up in plasterboard, and then suddenly about a month ago, after, what, four years of being finished, the client came to us and said, well, actually, some of our clients have said that this is a really sustainable building. Is that true? And we've said, yeah, it has actually really is a sustainable building. They said, oh, we think we're gonna mark it, the building on that basis from now on. Can you tell us a bit more about it? Like four years later. So that's kind of like, you know, so you're getting some sort of changes like that. Um, I live in a timber building that I developed with two friends. And I certainly think, you know, at very close hand, I've seen a kind of interest in, from them about where the buildings come from and what's happened. So yeah, there is some. I mean, it's kind of like, I, I you know, because for us as a practice, it's, that hasn't been what we've been focused on. I mean, it's very different building in the UK from building in North America or Europe, where the building regulations, the, the, the kind of, there's so much government support, there's so much kind of celebration around low carbon construction, whereas in the UK, they're just, it's just, there isn't in comparison to elsewhere, and we're so far behind here. You know, the idea of a kind of, you know, the idea of a sustainable building here is to make it like a Tupperware and, you know, put some triple glazing on it. Okay, right. Well, thank you very much indeed, 
Andrew, and um, you'll be around uh, at different points from the rest of the day. I'm sure you can catch him if you've got some more questions. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks Thank very you. much. Thank you. Right, we'd like to do our first Slido now, so if you can log on to slido.com. And again, the poll number is 803716. Now, I'm hoping you're going to see the same poll as I see. Um, but what we'd like to do is ask you to rate the following benefits of using timber in construction from one to five in terms of importance. Sustainability and low environmental impact, structural performance and durability, natural thermal insulation properties, aesthetically pleasing, and health and well-being. Okay, so definitely for all of you, Right up at almost the end of that, sustainability and a low environmental impact, which is great to see that really at the, the foundation of your thinking. Um, and then structural performance and durability. We'll be keeping these polls and using these uh, later in different pieces of social media. So thanks for contributing and you can revisit these uh, and rethink at that point. So now, um, I would like to move on to our next two speakers. So, a future with zero carbon timber schools, housing, Bali schools, as Andrew mentioned, factories, hospitals, offices made from homegrown mass timber is now within our reach. And I think we've seen that from Andrew's discussion. So, I'm delighted we are going to hear now from two examples uh, from two of our showcase, showcase uh, buildings here in the factory. So we're going to hear from Gen Zero, which is our next generation of Net Zero UK school designs, and then from Synergy, Scotland's first, grow, first homegrown mass timber house. So firstly, up she comes, it's Beverly Quinn. Uh, Beverly's a design advisor at the UK Department for Education, and she's a key member of the team responsible for designing zero carbon solutions for the 25,000 schools in England. So, over to you, Beverly, and tell us a bit about Gen Zero. Yeah, thanks very much. And yeah, we're very happy to be here and to exhibit our Gen Zero prototype where it was essentially manufactured in the vacuum press, so that's great. So I'll just go straight into Gen Zero. So Gen Zero was a huge research project that was carried out between 2019 to 2020. And the kind of key elements that we wanted to look at was ultra low embodied um, construction and also um, net zero carbon in operation and also the kind of enabling the offsite construction. So that was the kind of t the key points and a new platform for schools. The reason that timber was selected initially was because we felt like it was kind of um, under research, but obviously this this is all fantastic, and you know that's that's not really the case, which is which is ideal, and you know we've had so much support on the project. Apologies, I've just found the clicker. Um, so one of the other things with Gen Zero as well is that although we're doing this in the Department for Education. The, the much wider plan is that we will take this across other government departments. So the Department for Education will kind of carry out this research initially and then we'll kind of see how far we can go with it, which is, which is great and we've got good backing for that. Um, I'm just gonna move on. So this is just a kind of um, overview image of one of the two projects that we developed to Reba Stage 4. So this is a site on, uh, in Crawley, which is about 30 miles south of London. And as you, you can see, it's very kind of um, woodlandy. So you might have noticed over at Gen Zero, there's lots of trees. So we were just trying to demonstrate that one of the other kind of key features of Gen Zero was this biophilic element. Um, we've we've kind of taken the other parts of Gen Zero, for example, the biophilic design element, and we're implementing them on existing schools uh, just as a kind of starter, which is great. Um, just kind of moving straight in with the strategies. So we've split up the, the kind of the use of the spaces. So we've got the teaching block, the comms, and the halls. And 
one of the kind of um, really good things about that is that in those in those teaching spaces, you're you're getting like really good daylight levels because because it's um, you know we're not having to kind of squeeze in the halls and the commons, which is great. And just go on here a bit. So I'm just going to go through these. So this kind of split out lens really well because we for like the toilets and the, the kitchens, we're having these manufactured off site as well and just transported in and dropped in, which is great. And yeah, flexible accommodation. And I'm just gonna go back, I went a bit fast there. So that little yellow part there, that if you can see that highlighted, so that is the Gen Zero prototype that's, that's over in the corner there. So that's just to kind of show that it's, it's a cutout of a school then that we're not, um, you know, the DFE were not trying to make like wooden porta cabins for schools, um, just in case anyone thought that. <laughs> um, so again, that's just, um, that's kind of color coding with, but that fits our kind of standard accommodation schedule. Apologies, because I think this was meant to be a kind of moving graphic, but um, there we go. And one of the other kind of key takeaways that, you know, probably we should stress is this kind of the grid that, that, that we're working on. So um, essentially, you'll see over the prototype that the, the way the lights are, so they're on the grid and our floor construction is not in at the moment, but it is going to be a concrete construction. You probably think that sounds a bit, a bit odd, but we've got kind of a lot of research and looked into like the, the maintenance of floor finishes and carpets. Um, and things like that, and it's, it is kind of um, works out better to have the concrete instead, and it, it's durable, so it kind of takes away that maintenance element, and the floor slabs would be made to fit the grid, so you know they could be manufactured off-site and brought brought in, and you know you, we wouldn't have to be cutting any up, and that, you know that standardisation works really well. Um, so again, we've got. The, the standardized grids, so we're, we're getting the kind of the service spine as well, which is ideal. I'm just going to flick through a couple of these. And so, yeah, you can see here that, so because we've got this kind of grid system in place and the design suits it, we can have the spaces, you know, can be made, made to suit. So whether it's a, a cupboard or a teaching space or if it's... Um, like a staff zone, it kind of it all kind of fits on the same grid, which is great. So we have a we have a team at the DFE who's specifically, you know, working on this, and we are having our output specification um, released um, actually this month, um, and this kind of standardised grid does form part of the new output specification. And just while I'm kind of mentioning the so this so the. The timber construction is, is obviously a key feature, so you'll see that over in the prototype. The walls were manufactured using the vacuum press um, at the factory, which, which is great. And the reason behind the prototype, it wasn't, to, it wasn't to actually exhibit it at COP, it was to kind of get the lessons learned from you know, actually constructing that. So ecosystems technologies have been developing that for us and gathering all those kind of lessons learned and anything that's you know come out of actually doing that we can you know amend the the design and take that forward um, so just so you can see that we because of this um grid system you know the walls can be kind of placed it's anywhere there'll be a window as well at every, all the relevant banks standardized like lighting um, so that's just kind of showing like panelizing volumetric and that is just kind of the structure coming in. And essentially one of the key aspects as well is that we wanted to be able to manufacture off-site and then bring it and you know, build it on a school. And some of our other, other colleagues in other departments had a couple of concerns with the prototype and they said, you know, if it's going to be... So some of the prototype was um, constructed in 
Ecosystem Technologies factory in Invergordon, and some of our colleagues were a bit concerned, you know, is it going to make it back down to the factory for the exhibit? And, you know, we kind of said, well, well one of the parts is that we would ideally be, you know, making these schools in mass, possibly in the future. So if it can't make it from Invergordon to, to Glasgow one time, one classroom, then we're wasting our time with the whole project, essentially. So, um, so it has made it, which is great. So that's a tick for the, in the right direction. So I'm just going to move on. Apologies, I'm clicking through this. It usually um, would play like a kind of a video. So excuse me. So this is just some of the, um, for the, the, the kind of volumetric solutions for the, the toilets and the kitchens that will be kind of essentially delivered to the school sites. Um, we've standardized all of the services as well and one of our, a couple of things about Gen Zero, so although the, one of the really key focuses is on the, the construction, um, the timber construction, the low, ultra low embodied carbon, there are, there are so many parts to it and one of them is standardizing the services and we're kind of carrying out a separate project which is still part of Gen Zero and it's energy pods and we are essentially developing low carbon modular plant rooms um, because we have such a large existing school stock at the DFE we, you know we're looking to use these in retrofit initially as part you know as part of the testing and then we can kind of see see how we're going to roll those out which is which is great um, and because there's again so many different parts of Gen Zero and the different you know blocks we are also looking to so sorry, this is just a, a little image of the, the Crawley site. So in this dining area, the idea is that, you know, you can, you can look out and you can, um, you know, be at one with nature and you can um, see into the landscape and you can also kind of see along to the other blocks um, of the school. Um, just moving on, so the standardized furniture family, so Chalk Creative, so Tom is here if you have any very specific furniture questions, but it's a standardized um, furniture families, so I think it's just um, five chairs and this is all the kind of um, other um, furniture that we, we would need in a school and essentially everything's on wheels so it can just be moved around so the classrooms aren't set um, so that you know, they can just be used in, you know, however is required. And this, the furniture, what was all part of the kind of original um, research and Chalk Creatives have, have made it bespoke actually just for the prototype. And I had wrongly understood that it was, you know, we were getting this off the shelf, but you know, this is, this is um, kind of a new, new for them as well, which is fantastic. So you can see the furniture in the classroom. It's all natural finishes. Um, the the kind of the the metal like on the chairs has been kind of treated with wax, and so we didn't want any kind of nasty chemicals um, or, or paints or anything in Gen Zero. So you'll probably notice that the walls are just going to be that kind of bare wood finish. So we're not going to do any kind of further treatment. Um, these benches can just be sanded down and um, kind of reused. They're all can be taken apart as well. So if something happens to one of the components, it can be um, taken away and repaired, or you know, the, because there's only five um, chairs, we can kind of swap them out. So um, it's pretty great. So just kind of in theme with, with the event, so the embodied carbon. So the, l without looking at the, con the absolute technical detail of this, the building lifespan is 60 years. We can essentially, regrow the timber that's been used to build the school in those 60 years. So just looking at it in a really, really kind of simple, simple basis. Um, so we're, we're quite, um, you know, ha happy um, with that. And, and we're, you know, we're really glad that we've, you know, chosen timber to base the research on, which is great. Um, so operational carbon. So one of the, this actually ties in with our output specification which will be released this month because we have taken this part of Gen Zero and we have put it into the new school design requirements. So if anyone wants to see that in detail, it will be on gov.uk, um, the, the, the requirements. So there's going to be Annex 2G, which that annex, which is now part of the output specification for schools, 
is now required on all new buildings, which is great. Um, so that, that's just a bit of a breakdown of how um, <clears throat> you know, we've achieved this. And one of the kind of things I really kind of want to focus on is that within technical standards where the design team that I sit in, we also have an IT team and they've worked really, really hard on you know, focusing on how we can reduce energy you know, via IT without having to actually cut back um, you know, just how we take that forward. So there's, there's loads of plans in place for, for, for everything. Um, so again, we've um, carried out a lot of work on the um, mechanical and electrical systems. And you can see that um, we're using this heat, heat recovery system. I'm just going to kind of flick through the, the graphics. Um, but yeah, there are active choice of timber. So that's a kind of meeting teacher space. And you can see that it's, it's just the same as the classroom. It's, it's really just kind of smaller. And the, if you're wondering, you know, all the trees in front of the, the prototype, um, it, it's so that, you know, when we have these schools actually um, on site, that is what you're going to see when you're looking out the window, is this kind of um, foliage coming in. And some, when we were doing the research, we also considered, you know, the kind of cooling benefits as well of having that extra shading um, in the summertime. So that's just a kind of um, exploded um, image of the, the halls, the timber structure. So I think I'd mentioned before that to kind of further the research, we are going to look at sustainable pods. So we're kind of taking different parts of, of Gen Zero and um, essentially making more prototypes that we, we, we will use in real school settings, but it's really just to test this. So just um, to kind of push on that this is a research project that we're, you know, we're trying to take forward. Um, it's not something that we can just kind of implement immediately. We've, you know, we've taken the parts that we could implement immediately and released them quite quickly. Um, so that's just the, the sports hall timber structure. So it's just really nice kind of natural um, wood finishes, and you might recognize that's the, the vacuum press over there. So this is a prototype um, kind of in construction. So that's um, just an exploded um, image of the kit of parts. And that is how a kind of, the kind of classroom will be. But obviously the, the tables can be moved around and things like that as well. But it's, it's just um, a really you know, nice environment as well for, for the children to learn in, which is fantastic. And you can see we've just kind of um, noted out we've got the glue column columns, the CLT wall panels, the, the glue limb beams. So it's, it's um, yeah, the, the prototype, we're all really, you know, really impressed of how, how it's um, kind of come to life, which is great. And I'd mentioned that the kind of biophilic design element was a really kind of key part of the, the research. And we are... That it looks a bit kind of jungle-like, and that that you know that that's that's the idea. You know, we want it to be really full, a really full landscape, and we have taken a project forward, um, specifically to, to you know develop this to see what works as well, which is great. Um, we're going to be having these outdoor learning spaces, so all the, any kind of roof surfaces as well are going to have PV on them, which is great because that helps kind of balance out our um, operational carbon. And that's the, the commons, so we'll kind of cut through. So the idea is that you can just see right through. Um, so I think I've actually mentioned a couple of these throughout, but the, yeah, the next steps is that we're going to be doing the, the energy pods, the, um, the sustainable pods as well. And on our existing program, um, the school, revel um, school rebuilding program, we are going to be implementing parts of Gen Zero via pilots and pathfinders, which is really exciting. Um, so we'll be looking at, you know, for Gen Zero and re, re, um, retrofit and new build as well. Um, so that's um, hopefully a quick, a quick summary. But if anyone has any um, questions, I'll be here. But you can also find me over, over in the prototype if you've got any kind of really detailed ones. I can show more content or required, so thanks very much. Thanks, Beverly. Lots of great design-led and sustainable thinking gone into the design uh, of the prototype there. It's uh, quite inspirational.
and obviously so important for our children to be growing up and uh, you know being educated in zero carbon and very healthy environments and I think a, a point from a study in I think it was in Austria on the continent a few years ago which actually monitored children's heart rates um, within mass timber classrooms and it showed that their heart rates were about uh, 10 beats per second lower uh, within a mass timber setting and that it resulted in better behaviour, less excitement and um, also a, an improvement in performance. So lots of, uh, lots of benefits there. So next up is Nick Bolton. Uh, Nick Bolton is Head of Development at Synergy. Um, he is, has over 30 years experience developing places and partnerships which focus on sustainable growth. <laughs> Got stiff legs. Uh, Nick is going to tell us uh, about this amazing prototype here, just behind you. Uh, it's an all-electric smart home of the future and it's made from homegrown mass timber. But I'll not say much else and I'll let Nick tell us all about it. Thank you very thank much. You. It's always slightly strange to get your CV quoted at you as you come up. But mm -hmm. um, thank you for that. And, and good morning, everybody. I say my name's Nick Bolton. I'm a development director at... Is it like that? Sorry, Beverly. Slightly taller. There we go. Is that better? We're getting that? Great. So uh, my name's Nick Bolton. I'm development director at, at Synergy. Um, we're essentially a, a tech company really on a mission to drive uh, and, and, and offer and encourage sustainable, livable, low zero, zero carbon um, solutions to the construction industry. Um, but in, in bringing forward tech solutions around smart grids and energy solutions, uh, we've realized very clearly that there's a, there's a need to encourage the construction sector to not just operate better, but to build better in the first place. So part of our, our engagement with the construction sector has been about how we can, we can help find those, those solutions. I mean, just part of, in, in doing some our, our early stage research, I'm going to get the clicker the right way around. There we go. I mean, this, this is an obvious statement that er, anybody that's in Glasgow or anywhere on the planet, frankly, at the moment, recognises the challenge we face around a climate emergency. But the fact that 40% of the carbon emissions in the UK are generated by the residential construction sector, either in the homes that we live in or in the way we get to them and from them, around 40% of, of, of that carbon from there. That's a real motivator for us. But in doing that research, we also identified some other issues which were something of a surprise to us, that actually uh, resident across the UK, something like 9 million people self-identify as, as lonely. Um, and and that's worse for us than obesity, worse than smoking 15 cigarettes a day. So that was an added impetus to some of the work that, that I'll come on to that, we, that we've been doing with the, with the construction sector and development sector. But also, we've got a generation rent where 90% of 18 to 34 year olds um, are not sure how they're going to get onto the housing ladder, or even if they want to, in terms of buying and, and saddling themselves with mortgages. So that, again, was some of the, the drivers behind our, behind our thinking. And so, you know, going forward, um, we started to look at alternative solutions to, to bringing forward housing. So as well as the, the technology and the energy elements of the homes, as well as how they're built uh, physically, it's how we create places as well that people really want to live. So co-housing has really came to the fore in our, in our research as well. And that forms, uh, that sort of, you'll see where that feeds into the, the thread of the story around the building that you see behind you and what we've, what we've actually been uh, developing. So coming back to a few numbers, again, you know, material waste, something like 60% of all the material use in the UK is linked around the construction sector as well. Real heavy use of that 47 number difference from the 40 earlier, because it, essentially it's about all construction and just the construction elements. So again, it's a big number that, that we're responsible for as a sector that we really need to, to get to grips with. And you know, uh, other drivers and challenges that are really pushing things on is the, is the drive to 2050, um, 2025, I should say, and the fact that we're going to be building, we're already building in nearly two, 225,000 houses, houses a year in the UK. We're going to be building close to 300,000, hopefully. Um, and really, that's going to create, as we drive towards... Um, an all-electric future, so from 2025, future home standards, the transfer to um, all-electric homes, 
transfer to uh, transition to all electric vehicles. Really, that uh, that can potentially bring greater costs, greater complexity for the construction industry to how it tackles those energy challenges and how it builds better. Um, so, you know, our our role is really trying to find technology solutions that make that simpler and and reduce cost. Um, but we're faced with an industry, as uh, I think our, our first presenter said, that's not used to rapid change. Um, if we look at what the, the automotive industry has done since the 70s, and we look back at where the housing sector was in the 70s, we've had a fair bit of advancement um, in, the last, in the last 30, 40 years. But the, uh, the housing industry really hasn't moved in the same sort of way. The sort of automation, the sort of manufacturing efficiencies that have gone into whole numbers of sectors, not just the automotive sector, really just hasn't hit home in the construction sector. Fortunately, we're sitting in a place which is very different and is trying to do a lot of, you know, move that forward. But uh, we, we recognise that the sector is slow to move. So we've been looking at finding ways to make it easier for them to move and to encourage them to move. Hence our approach on the technology side, but also uh, leading us to think about how we might uh, you know, build better ourselves. So we have a technology solution that's about reducing cost, complexity, and the carbon for landowners, builders, uh, you know, and, and the residents through our smart grids approach. And that's about reducing the cost of the infrastructure to get energy and utilities to the site and how they're used within the homes. But we've also been looking at how, how we build better. So we've been involved over the last number of years in projects that, uh, yes, they have uh, great operational carbon reductions, and this is uh, a scheme or a couple of schemes that we were doing in, in the Midlands that have uh, net zero in operation um, and using modular construction, modern methods of construction. But this was sort of instigated four or five years ago, six years ago probably in practice. And uh, while it's a fantastic modern method of construction system, it's actually got quite a bit of embedded carbon in that process. And we learnt a great deal from those projects about how to operate the homes, what the sort of impact of more, inefficient, more efficient fabric can have, but it really opened our eyes up to the fact that actually uh, there may be a, a further step that we can, that we can go along. And um, a graph like this one, I'm not sure how clear that comes across to you out there, but you can see really there how it's not about just how the building is operated and how, how much we can reduce people's energy bills and use renewable energy on the homes to power all that. It's actually what's embedded in the home in the first place and how much we can lock away um, at the very beginning so we're not spending the first 20 years of the life of the house paying back the carbon that we've put into the building in the first place and that we're actually, we can start at a position where we're staving and getting to net zero. We've got a decade to really try and accelerate this and we don't want to be on the back foot for the first 20 years. So how can we uh, get, that, get that sorted out? So we, we, we came up with the Synergy Demonstrator project. As Beverly was saying about Gen Zero, we weren't necessarily aiming at COP. And in fact, we'd have missed COP completely if it, if it had gone ahead when it was supposed to have happened. But the project, uh, it's great to be part of the, uh, the zeitgeist that's really looking at this now. And so we we're really proud to be working with the team at CSIC here. Uh, ecosystems and Napier University, Innovate UK, to help us bring forward uh, a demonstrator that's really allowing us to, to build a, a home not dissimilar to the ones you saw in that earlier picture, but made in a very different way. Um, so I, I'll, I'll go back a slice. So what you can see there is what's sitting behind you, um, pretty much, nearly finished, not quite there. Um, in fact, it might even be there by the end of the week. But um, it's, uh, it's you know, come together over the last six or seven weeks in the factory here, um, constructed from CLT. So um, without repeating uh, our, our first speaker's uh, notes about all the, all the virtues of CLT, I will go back over some of them. But we've absolutely embraced that approach um, and using a homegrown Scottish timber to construct CLT panels, first CLT homegrown timber in the UK in that building, I think, in parallel with Gen Zero, I suspect we've probably both got there at a similar time on that one, out of the factory here. But, um, you know, but this enables us to have a, a test bed for a new construction system, but also 
uh, a test bed to demonstrate our, our energy and technology solutions. So when you go over to the home, if you haven't already done, you'll see upstairs there's some of the technology that helps the home itself run efficient, efficiently, but you'll see and you can talk to us about. Um, and Shane there at the back, you can see, who's our CEO. Um, you can talk to, to us about how that fits into a, a wider community and how we manage energy, uh, energy across uh, a community. Um, and talking of that, what you're actually looking at behind you isn't a freestanding house. It's a slice within a community. You can just see there that red slice. It's a, a two-bed uh, duplex unit as part of a, a wider community of around 150 people, around 112, 115 homes mix of one and two bed apartments, focused around a co-housing, co-living approach, private spaces, um, shared, sp shared places, um, and uh, so the re gives us a great opportunity to have an exposed view of the, of the CLT to today rather than the finish that you might expect to see on a, norm on, on a house, um, but actually um, that's also a unit that we may well end up building as a, as a freestanding home because it, it can operate in that way as, as well. Um, but just coming, putting some numbers on that, how much, uh, how much carbon we can lock away. If you look at a traditional build, had we built that community that I was just showing you there, we'd be putting around 100, 2,000 tonnes, I should say, of carbon uh, into the atmosphere. Building it... Um, with the CLT approach and timber across the whole, uh, whole development, we're looking at sequestrating something like two and a half thousand tonnes. So we've got a net gain of nearly 5,000 tonnes of, of, uh, of CO2. Um, just other, there's a number of other numbers, but in just in terms of the, the lightness, the, the ability to have lower traffic movements on site, the speed of operation when we're constructing it, constructing it in a factory means we have a, a great deal of redu reduction in, in, in transport movements you know, best part of uh, a sixth of the, of the movements of lorries to and from the site. I'm not sure if this one will animate. I'm hoping that it will. Is it, gonna, it is going to animate. There we go. I don't have to click, Beverly. You have that disadvantage. Um, so this is just showing that we've taken a digital twin approach, working with the team here at CSIC in that in, in a, and, and innovate with our project. Um, looking at all the elements that's allowed us to plan over the last 12 or more months how we're going to put this together. And then you, over the last six, seven weeks, looking at how that actually works in practice, starting to iron out the inevitable glitches that will come as trying to put a volumetric home together in a factory with a new build system and some of the technologies that we've incorporated in there, including MVHR, mechanical ventilation, heat recovery systems. We also have PV on the roof. We have um, a uh, low uh, infrared heating system. And we're also, on the, on the hot water side, we've got a, 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 what's called a sun amp, which is a phase change material that helps support uh, hot water. So we, again, we've got an all-electric approach to heating the, the home. No gas in our developments at all. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about this because I'm conscious late, later on we've got some of the rest of the team that have been involved in constructing. They're going to talk in, data, in detail about, about how it's put together. But suffice to say, that digital approach and that circular supply chain approach is really at the heart of what we're looking to encourage. And we're, we're looking to build it ourselves to demonstrate what, how, how it can be done commercially, but talking with partners about how they can play a part in that as well to really to scale this up across the industry, not just have a, another demonstrator, or another showcase uh, scheme. We've, we're running out of time to make a big change, so let's, let's actually show how it can be scaled up economically. But some of the, the long-term advantages around uh, you know, manufacturing efficiencies, speed of installation, the way that it cuts down on maintenance during operation, the quality of the build means we have much less to do uh, once the building's up. Um, but also that the whole you know, post-life re recycling, reusability, uh, repurposing of materials is so much higher, obviously, when you've got a timber product in, in the first place. So. Some, some pictures, really, of how that community is going to come together. Shared spaces, fully timber, con full timber construction here. Just, uh, in fact, just some nice pictures, really, to wrap up, give you an idea of the sorts of space that we're going to create, exposing the timber. So people, again, uh, 
was, was a little time earlier, we're talking about how people aren't aware of what they're living in. I think it's important to a degree that they are aware and embrace it and, and celebrate that. Don't, we don't have to push, push it too, too hard because I think it's a, a fantastic material, but um, I think it's great to, to see, see it in use. Final example uh, where we're also taking the full shared approach and back to our technology piece and what Synergy uh, are about in terms of uh, reducing energy costs. You can see their shared services around mobility, electric vehicles, electric bikes. We have a communal battery that captures the communal energy generated on all the roofs and allows us to uh, generate the uh, power of the cars and the and the e-mobility from uh, from the from the the community's own energy. And you can go and have a look at this. I've got these slides and pictures in the CGI's. But hopefully, there's a fairly close match between what you can see there and what you can see behind you. But do go over, have a look, come and talk to us about how it was put together and how it's going to operate and where we're going to be building these across the UK in the very near future. Um, so that was that was me. Thank you very much. Thanks, Nick. If you want to take a seat here on the stage. Um, I've always been so impressed with Synergy. It really is, um, really, really is a great example of a very strong fabric first approach to building, sequestrating as much carbon as possible and backing it up with a really well thought out uh, energy system to support the, uh, the remaining needs as opposed to putting energy first. Um, so it's a real step change for us too, um, particularly um, that now that the building has been made in homegrown timber and hope that that, can, that momentum can be maintained into the future. So over to you guys. Um, I've got a bit of time. Hope you're warm enough. We are going to tell you we are going to put the heating on for a big blast at the break so nobody run away because they're cold. <laughs> it should be warmer when you come back. Uh, and remember, we do have some blankets up the back if, uh, if anybody would like one. But I'm surviving in this dress with bare legs, so you should be, <laughs> okay? So, um, Nick and Beverly are open to questions from the floor. Has anybody uh, got anything they would like to ask? Hi, um, my name's Ivor Jackson, I'm an engineer. Um, we're quite... Um, we do a lot of projects with sustainable urban drainage. So I just wondered in the, the sort of developments that you're doing, whether you're actually incorporating that at the moment or if that's yet to come. I'm really, I missed the, the one key word in Sorry, there. the sustainable urban drainage. So if you're ah, so yeah. yeah. So that's a bit I missed. So uh, absolutely. I mean, it, obviously it depends on the particular site that we're, we're building in, but SUDS and that, that communal garden approach gives us a great opportunity as Gen Zero were showing in there as, as well to incorporate SUDS uh, approaches to, uh, to to drainage, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and we're 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 the same for if that's a really big focus on Gen Zero and one of the primary schools that we're using to kind of pilot the biophilic design right. elements. That suds is a big part of that, so yeah, absolutely. And um, we would be looking to you know implement that you know officially going you know in the future. Um. Thank you, uh, first of all, for your presentation. Uh, I just uh, have got two um, quick questions here. One is, um, it's really interesting to see uh, we are moving to, to look at um, locally available material as this um, house here is built and designed with um, homegrown uh, timber. But uh, looking at the figures like 300,000 homes that's going to be built annually um, from 20, I think 25 on, onwards, uh, I'll be really capable to produce uh, timber that will cover, as far as I know, is, is about only 13% we are using uh, locally available uh, timber within the UK and mostly from Scotland, and the remaining is imported um, from outside the UK. So it's just how sustainable this is going to be with these high figures. The second question is, uh, as I can see, this um, new movement also to a modular design and, and, and construction. Uh, I would like really to see uh, those co components, uh, whether it's well, it's, uh, in, for the structure or the system, to be certified um, within a standard or to meet a standard. For example, whatever the standard is, 
uh, to make sure that these components are designed and constructed um, sustainably. So not, not just looking at uh, the material, but from construction to uh, demolition, I, I would say. So how those are certified, and also how they perform and guarantee that it's going to meet the, um, well, nearly zero uh, carbon emissions or carbon buildings or, uh, or how to meet these standards. That's my question. So does, uh, I picked out three in there probably, <laughs> questions. Yeah, the fir first one uh, around the sustainability of uh, using homegrown. I don't think for a minute that at this point we can suggest that 300,000 houses can get constructed out of the current supply chain. I think there's a great deal more that can be, and we're keen to encourage and allow that or find a, a route that can support the, the sector to start to scale up. But I think there's still, it's not going to completely substitute imports. I think we can look for how we make that as sustainable as possible, that we're buying it, getting it from the right sorts of forests in the first place, that we are... Um, bringing it across in you know, hydrogen power ships rather than diesel power ships. Anything we can do to start to chip away at that, we can take some action. I don't think um, it, it's, it's a complete solution. I mean, we are part of the, actually, as we say homegrown timber, so the deck actually out there, you'll, you'll hear from Scott later on this afternoon around the sort of um, sustainable forests uh, in, uh, in rainforests. So we're, we're, we're also keen to support bringing in sustainable timber from those locations. So there isn't a complete dead cut off for those places where we save those forests from deforestation, but we, we, we find that really hard to do because we're not encouraging the communities to manage those forests more, more sustainably. So we've got a, a supply chain where we're still making use of that. So we'll be topping it up in that sustainable way as well. But Scott can talk far more eloquently about that later on, I'm sure. Um, how they're built. Uh, better in operation. So uh, there's the, one of the key standards on modular and, and, and MMC is uh, BOPAS, which is a, a modular system certification. It's still developing in its relative infancies, but we're keen to, again, be part of the process of firming that, that certification up. And as well, in, in operation, I mean, th there are starting to be um, performance contracts. A lot of Local authorities are starting to look at, when they're looking at their affordable housing, going into schemes where they are requiring a performance contract. If, you're, if we're saying it's going to be net zero in operation and we're aiming for these sorts of energy bills, they are starting to look at how, and we're happy to engage in how they're contracted to achieve those standards going forward. So, and being in control of how the energy is generated and managed locally within the, within the community and the building makes that a lot easier to achieve as well. So... Was, that's sort of the sort of the two questions. One was about how it's built and also how it's operated. I think so. Yeah, and I'll just sorry, I'll just chip in as well that um, part of the the Gen Zero design is that, that that we want to take forward in the research is that we would like to take this you know across government departments. So we would have to create a you know a standardised design guide that you know that would have to be used, and you know, certain particular standards that we would set would have to be achieved. So, you know, it would be, I suppose, mandated in that way um, when the research develops. Thank you. I'm actually um, going to just pitch in and maybe bring put Andy on the spot <laughs> from Concor. Um, but your question, Andy, you had, you had left just uh, quickly at that point, but there was a question about the... Uh, you know, how able are Scotland's forests or UK forests uh, you know, going to be able to supply uh, the, the, um, you know, the, the trees that would be required to build 300,000 new homes? So explaining that it is a transition. And obviously in Scotland, um, the, uh, we're working with Scottish government and Confor has been in influencing them uh, as well in terms of the supply chain development program and really beginning to put in place plans in terms of increased planting over the years so that we have a full understanding and this is part of a wider study we have a full understanding of the supply needs and how we can uh, you know back that up with future uh, future planting regimes so that we know how much is available to uh, you know to feed um, into the construction sector and in higher value applications like mass timber Andy, do you want to add to that? Yeah, well, I mean, if you're around at half past one, you'll, you'll find out <laughs> all the answers. <laughs> but, but in reality, I mean, um, we've been investing in forests for the last 50, 60 years in the UK. We're currently harvesting about 10 million tonnes of timber. But it goes to all sorts of different markets. 
But in the UK, we are massive, really hungry wood users, and over 80% of the wood we use is imported. So that's why the governments are now looking, and governments have made that pledge to plant 30,000 hectares a year from 23 to 24. Um, what we need to do is get the message across to government that it has to be a lot of productive forestry because you need that feedstock to be able to do these kind of things. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Yes. Great. Got another question? I'm really struck. I, I, I came today because of the images of this unit um, and, uh, and the innovation and the, and the uh, concept of homegrown CLT. <clears throat> it's so slow taking off, it's a shame. Um, but I'm also fascinated because I'm a trustee of Co-Housing Scotland um, and you're um, breaking new ground in both technology but also in the social and the, and the constructional. Um, lots of little boxes on prime agricultural land is not going to be solving the problem. Um, so uh, I, I, for anybody who's here, we'll, we'll chat afterwards. But um, how, how, how much have you um, engaged with UK co-housing network and, and so on in, in terms of that social component? Because that might be the driver for a different way of uh, housing delivery rather than just um, the big six, you know, you get what you're given. So the honest answer is not enough yet, but I mean, our, our, the whole sort of co-housing approach has been a, a piece of research we do doing over the last two years, really looking at the, the basic principles of it, understanding it, talking with various schemes that have, have, have developed uh, built-to-rent co-housing uh, approaches. Um, really, as, as you say, looking for us, it's about trying to encourage the wider sector to do better things. But for our own developments, we're just getting to a stage now where we're probably 18 months away from our first volume scheme and just at the point to need to have the conversations you're offering. So keen, keen to do that, absolutely. I think, you know, it, it, and in terms of where we're looking to build them, there's a combination of brownfield and some greenfield. So we're looking actually a lot of uh, sustainable urban extensions to existing developments around um, uh, reuse of MOD sites is, is a key area where some of the bigger schemes are, are coming forward. But you know, it would be great to have a conversation. Any other questions from the floor? Over here, Danielle. Okay, thanks. Um, thank you again for really inspiring and exciting presentations. Um, I was trying to formulate my question and I haven't got there yet, but it's about how do we better connect um, these buildings and these construction techniques with, with the forest and then perhaps with local authorities or uh, government departments, you're saying MOD, how do, how do we sort of make those connections? Because sometimes we see, it's great to hear this from the Department for Education, but then you look sometimes at what DEFRA do, is doing or Zach Goldsmith lack of interest in, um, in timber construction. How, how do we kind of join all of that together a lot better? I'll go first. So I joined the DFE in July this year and <clears throat> every, I mean, Gen Zero started in 2019 and we've had so, you know, so much interest, you know, getting people on board and our plans are to take this across kind of other government departments, but really we want to be in a position where we've furthered the research and, you know, like the Gen Zero prototype was a part of that and the other kind of things that I'd mentioned. That's, I think that's where, the, where we sit just now. And I think obviously just now maybe that that's not happening, but we, we don't, we're not really in a position where we want to, you know, reach out to all of the other departments where, you know, we're not really got like a solid offering essentially. So um, keep a lookout and <laughs> hopefully then, you know, that's, that's something for the future that, that will happen. But I completely um, can see where you're, where you're coming from and we do, we do see a really big, big future for it. No, but no magic bullet. I'm afraid it's just keep pushing and, uh, and and argue for that join up and find examples where we can demonstrate it. Whether it's through the education and the sector, or whether it's through the housing sector, you know, lobbying and so on. There's there is no no magic way. I'm afraid. Um, 
D disjointed approaches seems to be our, our way too, too often. But you know, where we've got, a, a, in, our, in our project, and, and again, it will be talked about more this afternoon, how that whole supply chain can be made to work, I think the more projects like that that we can shout about, and we're keen to, to do that, the better. Andy? I think it was more really in response to what Andrew was saying there. I mean, the, the gates have maybe just opened up in the last couple of days. Uh, Zach Goldsmith has actually just sent out invitations to create a working group to look at increasing the use of timber in construction. And that's just happened in the last day or two, so uh, things are starting to move. So as you say, keep pushing. Good news. <laughs> Any other questions? Danielle at the front again. Hi, morning. Very exciting project, progress you're making with this, um, what we call prototype, but I'm just wondering in your journey, how far are you down the lines of um, acceptance and in terms of perception by commercial lenders and maybe third party providers like NHBC and Zurich? How far are you, are you on that journey? Uh, NHBC? Uh, um, can I move on? Um, <laughs> beyond NHBC at this point. Um, acceptance, I mean, the, the, key, the key one actually in practice is, is the funders. That's the area that's you know, still relatively traditional. I mean, again, seeing a seat change, maybe not in the last four days, but in the last 18 months, the number of investors that are, uh, you know, cottoning on and, and their, their own investors pushing them or they're uh, around ESG and the need to, to look at this much more clear, much more rigorously, I think. Um, and we're starting to even be approached now by funders that specifically want to fund timber. Um, they are in the minority at the moment, most definitely, but it's, there is, a, I can definitely see a, a, a turning of the corner. Um, and all we can do is, is sort of identify how it can be a much better product for them as an investment, both not just because it's the right thing to do, but, it, for, but it's actually economically the sensible thing to do. Okay. Oh, one more down here, Danielle. Oh, sorry, Stephen. So I'll just ask a very <laughs> quick one to both Beverly and, and Nick. Um, you've obviously been working hard on solutions for... Uh, new build applications. I wonder if either of you have got plans to explore how this research could inform the elephant in the room, I guess, around retrofit. Yeah, so at the Department for Education, we are looking to implement parts of Gen Zero on retrofit, so existing schools. So at literally right now, we're just identifying which schools that we can... Um, you know, which schools that we can implement parts of Gen Zero and also which parts that we could test on retrofit. So we are doing that right now. And I think that in the next probably three weeks, we'll be in a position, we'll be announcing, you know, which schools they are and, you know, which, which bits we're taking forward. So, um, yeah, that, that's the plan because obviously we have such a large existing school stock as well. Yeah, I mean... From, from a synergy perspective, obviously the energy side of things and the solutions, the technologies that can go into the homes or communities and the smart grids that can support that is, it, it has lots of potential applicability to retrofit. Our focus is on new build at the moment, but we are already in conversations about how that might apply on a retrofit from the construction perspective, back to what War Sithelton was saying earlier about the potential to repurpose existing buildings in a way that's more progressive uh, utilising, you know, creating more space or get, you know, going up, going out, using timber. I think hopefully what, we, what we're showing here shows ways that that can be, be applied. And it's not our key focus at the moment. But, yeah. Thank you. One more. Hi. Um, I'm from Chile. We have almost the same problem as you. We have the timber, but we don't have that kind of construction yet. But one of the key problems I think will happen in uh, until 2050 is how do we account for the sequestered carbon? Because right now, it, it doesn't count. So internationally, there's no standard, there's no consensus, and it's, a, of course, a key driver for timber construction. How do you deal with it? How, you, how are you considering? I don't want to get into the first part of the life cycle, which is very complicated, but probably what we can work with based on design. So end of life cycle, how do you do your design, how do you consider you know, repurposing or recycling or adaptation, that sort of thing. 
Yes, I mean, that, that one simple circle that we were showing on the picture is, is, is part of the project that, that the demonstrator is part of, is looking at that afterlife, what happens in terms of reusing materials or recycling materials, repurposing elements of the building. You take those panels down, you know, it, it, for, if for whatever reason that building isn't wanted for that purpose, that panel could be repurposed as a panel, some of the internal timbers. If not, you know, it's a material that can get reused for insulation on another building elsewhere, so absolutely that's part of the... Uh, and creating a digital twin that goes not just from the design stage, but all the way through to that as well, is again a part of what we, we're, ho we're, we're hoping to benefit from ourselves as the project develops that. Yeah, and we're, we're exactly the same. You know, the, um, the kit of parts, which, you know, essentially make, makes the classroom, that is designed to be, you know, assembled and obviously disassembled and reused. So, yeah, there's, there, we're still kind of in that kind of research project, but that is a really big thing that, we're, you know, we're looking at for, for the end of life as well. Okay. Oh, hands up there. Daniel spotted you. Uh, hi, thank you for both of your presentations. Just wondering if you've encountered many and maybe any resistance to these schemes because we've talked quite a lot about how the construction industry has been quite slow, but has there actually been any pushback or is it just a lack of investment that you've struggled with? Okay. Okay. Uh, pushback, I suppose it's not, it's not yeah, from, from the construction side or uh, uh, landowners then it comes back to the investment piece. And they're saying, well, that's great, but nobody will fund it. Um, and then we found we're starting to see an increasing number that will. Um, there is the, the regulatory concern and the challenge. There's a pushback there, you know, around uh, the reactionary approach to fire risk, um, which we we again as part of this project, we're, there's an active element uh, looking at the fire resistance and the fire um, effect um, as part of the project, so we can add more science and information into that argument but there is a degree of pushback when people you know, hear timber and then have a, uh, a reaction I, I was about to say irrational it's not necessarily an irrational one it would be unfair to say that people think timber burns um, but in in a mass timber solution it doesn't and so it's getting the evidence together and that's what we're doing part of the project is about putting the evidence together to make that argument back again and I, um, I think that I wouldn't say so much that there's been pushback, but I think it's maybe lack of awareness, lack of awareness of the project and maybe of some of the intricacies. So one of the really things that we've been fortunate, you know, exhibiting here is that we've got a new website and, you know, we're, we're here. So, you know, we want, as, you know, to show as many people um, internally at the Department for Education as well, you know, what's going on. Because I think that where there's pushback, it's, it's often maybe where there's not enough understanding of, of, of the benefits. So we're, um, I think th this this event is, is put us in a, you know, much better um, situation. And the, the prototype, you know, that we can show people, we've got, um, Colleagues from the DFE coming along, you know, this week and next week, which which will be great, and that will just um, hopefully just bring bring more support support essentially. Any final questions? Oh, one at the back. I was quite impressed by the by the, the prototype that you have done here, but one of the one of the that as the problems that we have with construction is actually skilled labour. And having a look at the prototype, it would look that that actually addresses the, the, the shortage of skills. And it looks as though it would be far labour intensive. Do you have any uh, figures on the banners saved? It would be from a standard uh, construction built project. I, I mean, that. The skills issue is a challenge for the construction sector anyway. I think even if we did nothing, this, I think the construction industry would start knocking on our door. Uh, and I mean by our, I mean modular construction, off-site construction, factory-based construction, because the skills are gradually dwindling and the costs are going up on site for traditional build. Um, the opportunity for people to reskill, to offer a, you know, a, maybe a, a more attractive, more technology-based approach for people coming out of university or coming out of college and school, that they're not standing in a, a windy, wet, muddy field trying to put blocks on top of each other with cement. 
um, they can come and work in a technology-based factory. I think there's a real opportunity to do that. I, have, I don't have facts and figures for you and, on how that's shifting, but I do. you can see the labour force tightening going on and the price increases that are happening. Um, you know, there's a real, the real push in that direction and a great opportunity through this. Yeah, unfortunately, we don't have any facts and figures either, and our prototype is, is not long complete. So we will take a lot of you know, lessons learned from that and from the sustainable pods as well, which we can take forward. Excellent. Anybody else have anything to add? Nope. Quick scan. I'm itching to do the comedian thing, which is uh, I'm here all day. Okay. Thanks. I just want to get that in <laughs> over there. Yeah, both Beverly and Nick are both here all day, um, and will um, will be obviously part of the conference. But um, at your respective prototypes as well, for anybody that wants to discuss any aspects in more detail. Right. Well, we're actually, for once, slightly ahead of schedule. So don't say we're not good to you. It wasn't due to be a coffee break, but I'm sure some of you could do with a wee warm up. So um, there's a coffee truck uh, out in the yard. Yeah, uh, coffee truck out in the yard and um, you're all welcome to go out there until midday and maybe get yourself something to warm up and bring it back into the factory. Alternatively, you could meet me in Synergy House and I think I might do a wee warm up exercise session to myself. <laughs> so a bit of a jump about and then we'll be all warm again for sitting down at 12. Thank you. So if you can congregate back here by 12, we'll put the heaters on, you'll have had your coffee, a bit of a jump about. There we go. <laughs> Thanks.
Thank you.
Hallo. The Wood for Good Conference is about to resume. If you can take your seats, please. Come in from the tropical climate outside into the factory. <laughs> Right, roll up, roll up again, back to the Wood for Good conference. I hope we've not got some casualties from this morning. <laughs> the softies who couldn't, who couldn't sit for much longer. Right, well, we'll start. Stuart, do you want to come up on the, up on the stage? So our next session is entitled Mainstreaming Timber in Construction. Uh, so I hope you've all enjoyed some coffee and goodies from the, uh, from the coffee truck and also some of the stories from um, Cities for Forests who are behind that. Uh, they certainly told me that my decaffeinated coffee this morning was, uh, um, uh, was, was, was gathered and created the, the beans as an alternative to decaf, apparently, but it was all by women in Mexico, so I was doing good. Uh, doing good by society as well as myself and drinking decaf coffee. Anyway, I didn't manage to get a coffee at that break, so uh, I will be doing exercises behind the stage shortly. Anyway, um, this is Stuart Delgarno. He's a Product uh, Development Director at Stuart Mill Timber Systems. And Stuart has worked for Stuart Mill Group since 1984. <laughs> <laughs> starting as an apprentice and progressing to managing director of their off-site timber frame operations. So his current senior group role is responsible for all the research and development, product and process improvement across the group. And we work very closely with Stuart and uh, the Stuart Milne Group here in the factory and our wider activity. So in 2010, Stuart developed the UK's first near zero carbon Sigma prototype home and the group's triple award-winning Sigma II off-site building system. So it's all about mainstreaming now because you've been at it for, uh, for a long time. Stuart is the current project director for AMCH, which is the UK's flagship housing industrialization project, which has four million pounds of funding from Innovate UK through the Industrial Strategy Fund's Transforming Construction Call. We are delighted to say we're also a partner in that project. Anyway, uh, Without having you all sitting longer, I'll just pass over to Stuart. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lucy. Yeah, Stuart Ogarno, Director of Product Development at Stuart Mill Group. We are a UK's leading independent private house builder, building a thousand homes every year, uh, predominantly in Scotland and in Northwest uh, England. And we are the UK's largest off-site timber frame manufacturing uh, business, with three manufacturing facilities producing currently eight and a half thousand homes we make a home every 43 minutes in our factories. So by the time I'm finished, we'll probably have made a couple of houses uh, today. And I'm going to talk about mainstreaming timber frame construction in low-rise residential um, applications. Is that working? Are you going to have to scroll through it? Yeah. Okay. Right, sorry about that. 
Um, our aspiration is to be a net zero carbon business delivering sustainable communities, homes and off-site solutions. That's at the essence of what we want to do as a, a business. And as part of that, we believe timber is at the root of our solution um, for our business over the last 45 years and going forward. We're glad to see in the net zero carbon strategy announced by government that timber was favoured as a system that should be supported going forward as has a large part to play in the decarbonisation of the UK to ensure that our homes and our communities of the future are fit for purpose using the best renewable materials around. Sustainability has been at the heart of our business for years and years and years. We focus on product, people and planet. And our sustainability strategy at Stuart Mill Timber Systems, our timber frame business, really focuses hard on delivering KPIs, annual measurements, that look at how we are working as a business ourselves, how we are supporting our customers to decarbonise, and what we're doing to ensure our people breed a culture of being innovative, but sustainable and culturally minded towards looking after the planet and what we're about as a business. We believe that sort of thinking and that carbon strategy can feed into our customers as well. Helping them to reduce their carbon footprint as well. So we are not only a developer ourselves, but we're also a supplier of goods to other developers. So everything from a small project to an SME, to a housing association, or even a large private developers like the Barretts, Taylor Wimpies, we supply them. And we're working with them to ensure that they reduce their carbon footprint, moving away from brick and block, concrete built homes to timber construction. Currently in the UK, timber is about 25% of the UK housing market. We think that can go to 50% as a minimum and upwards to 70 or 85%. In Scotland, we lead the way with 85% of all new built homes are timber frame construction. And we see timber as a solution to a lot of these answers that we've had today. It's a great material, it's a certified material, it's got lots of really good certification systems. So for every tree you plant, you produce a, a, a tree, in 40 years you harvest it, you turn it into structural grade timber that we can then build a home with going forward. And that's been around for years and years and years. And people like Confer in the, in the UK industries here and our partners in Sweden and Finland and other countries across the world naturally harvest sustainable timber sources. Timber frames, as I say, can be a significant player in the market for housing going forward. And one of the key things that we like about timber is its embodied carbon uh, footprint. And we've been doing some work through our MCH project, the next slide please, about mapping the timber frame uh, body carbon benefits of a brick and block built house versus a timber frame house. And over a 60 year, including sequestration, it's a 12 tons saving. You might say, what does 12 tons look like? Well, it's a single car driving around the world 1.7 times. Now we are gonna build 300,000 houses in the UK. Currently the timber frame market is about 60,000 homes. If that doubles to 120,000 homes, that's 120,000 times, 1.7 times around the world of carbon saving into the atmosphere. That's a great story. And businesses are looking for solutions in terms of how they can actually reduce their carbon footprint. Our focus has been on the structural shell. We are a panelized timber frame supplier. We do not produce uh, modular systems like the one on display here. We are panelized MMC systems. Our focus is on building a structural shell, wind and water tight, insulated, windows fitted, pre-finished floor, roof on the deck, no scaffolding, roof tiled in less than seven hours. So the structural shell complete, wind and water tight in a day. That then allows the fallen on trays to come in, fit the kitchen, fit the bathrooms, complete the home, and then clad the building around the outside with traditional materials, be that stone, block, render or brickwork. You can get a mortgage, NHBC love us, banks love us, lenders love us, because you can get a mortgage. It's a sustainable, renewable, used material, but also proven with a heritage of um, acceptability in the marketplace. It's at the cusp of being a mainstream solution. 
Yes, there's things we are looking to do in the future. So working with AMCH and the Innovation Centre here, looking to think about pod and panels. So if we dropped in a bathroom pod as part of the shell process, if we did other things as part of the build, maybe putting a facade in the factory, for example, we could increase the amount of off-site manufacturing to a position that maybe in 5, 10, 20, 30 years, where the majority of the home is done in the factory. But if you want a here and now solution for reducing your carbon footprint and delivering a viable, cost-effective, mainstream, acceptable way, timber frame is the way to go. And building with timber has lots of benefits, not just the fact that it's cost competitive, we will be on the money versus brick and block every day of the week. We'll be within two or three percent of their cost base. And if you take speed into the consideration, we'll be quicker. So for some markets, it's even better. So affordable housing, where we're building things out, or apartment blocks, we need to build them out quickly and speed's a driver. Timber frame is often a more cost effective way to go. Even in a private sale, where you're building one a week, selling one a week, you can factor in your build to be cost competitive just on price alone. And also, if you look forward to what the government's doing, the next slide. We see in England a move towards uh, more modern methods of construction. Homes England fund all affordable homes in England currently. Huge landowner, huge uh, funder. They've now encouraged, as part of their funding criteria, that all funding released in England for affordable housing requires a 25% MMC requirement. MMC is defined as seven categories. Category two is panelised timber frame, and it has to have a pre-manufactured value of 55%. Pre-manufactured means the volume of work done in the factory versus volume of work done on site. That's driving the market towards adopting these systems. I would call on the Scottish Government to think about doing something similar. Even though we currently use 85% timber frame, we need to develop the next generation timber frame, including closed panels, other incremental improvements that we could make from an indigenous supply chain that can service our existing uh, marketplace. And also, these systems that we're developing, closed panel technology, that, that is the sort of mainstay of achieving 55% needs to be certified and approved. The question was asked earlier today. We've got BOPAS, we've had it for five years. We've got BBE certification, we've got NHBC accepts approval in our systems. We can get a mortgage, you can get insurance. We've got um, durability assessments for at least 60 years. Everything's designed for a minimum design life of 60 years. So that means that banks can support us. Mortgages can be given. Uh, insurance can be provided on the homes that we're producing. And that de-risks any concerns that a developer or a housing association may have with their housing stock. It's really important we have these uh, certification schemes in place and that people adopt them and use them. PMV, the question was asked, pre-manufactured value. It's a new term. It's like all these things. But write it down because I'm pretty sure people will start to get their head around what that actually means to them. And if you're a developer or if you're an affordable provider, whether you're a small SME or a large builder, you'll start to be asked questions about what your PMV score is for your development. And that's essentially a driver towards modern methods off-site construction systems. England have started that journey by specifying a metric. Scotland have yet to do so, but are likely to do so, I believe. So, uh, on the built environment, we can do many things. Our focus is on low-rise housing and apartments up to four or five storey. That's where our limits are. Uh, but we can also do other buildings. We've got open panel systems and closed panel systems. Closed panel systems can have the fire protection pre-fitted, the windows pre-fitted for both party walls and for external walls, providing a fire-safe solution during construction and in use. So any concern with fire safety is just not applicable to timber frame up to four storeys, which is essentially a, a, under the 18 metre threshold that uh, Grenfell has been looking at. Scotland, as you may be aware, in apartments recently, multi-occupants buildings have now introduced sprinklers. So that's an additional uh, mitigation measure that allows uh, um, absolute certainty that the holistic approach to building design, including the materials you use and the systems and risk mitigation measures are appropriate for that building. 
Now, through EMCH, we've been doing a lot of work to look at not just what we use, but also the, the housing designs and the processes we use. So we have to embrace new ways as well. We have to move towards digital design, 3D BIM technology. We have to integrate a more complicated design. We will have heat pumps in the future. We will have battery storage. We will have thermal stores. There will be other things we'll have to integrate, ventilation. So services and building fabric need to come together. The best way to do that is to use 3D BIM model modeling. So things like Revit technology that's from AutoCAD to actually use that and to then create that information to then flow into the factories so that our factories can be efficient to produce a product and flow into the building site so that the guys on the site have got information at the point of use makes our life easy to assemble uh, the homes. And also embracing manufacturing. Timber frame is a low energy manufacturing system. It does not use energy. We're about to design some PV arrays in our factory in Whitney in Oxfordshire, a 3,000 unit PV array, which will actually mean we produce more power than we consume. We will be self-sufficient as a factory. So all our equipment, all our forklifts, and all our um, potential um, customers and our staff coming to work have the ability to potentially charge our car and actually run our equipment. We can use our waste heat, our waste timbers, to create heat and then decarbonize, obviously, the outputs of the emissions to create heat as well. Or we can actually, in the future, look to battery storage. But it's not just about that. It's also about the type of equipment. Somebody mentioned high-value jobs earlier on. The image on the left is the world's first fully automated uh, robotic production line, an £8.3 million investment that we are currently making. That machine will be coming into Whitney in Oxfordshire in less than 12 months' time. It's got seven robots on it and developing robotic technologies. We are creating high-value jobs that will ensure we've got a more diverse, younger workforce who want to come and work on us. We can't have factories where we're relying on people lifting heavy things and assembling heavy things. We need to move towards how the car industry have operated. We're on that journey. That technology could be deployed into Scotland in due course when the PMV number increases to a more developed product. We're developing that technology. That is world leading. And the last thing we've done is create digital twins. So we think a hub and spoke factory design is a good system so that local jobs can be created. We've developed a hub, which is a large manual or automated hub that produces 5,000 homes, or a spoke, which is a smaller 2,500 unit manually on orientated spoke. Done this with the Manufacturing Technology Centre, working with the Construction Scotland Innovation Centre and MCH to create digital twins of future factories that we can deploy. So if we've got a pipeline of work in a certain location, we can actually have a pop-up factory to make product close to that site. But it's also about the construction as well. So, you know, reducing emissions. If we do more in the factory, so insulate things, put the window in, have pre-finished floors, we don't need so much trucks coming to our site. We don't need so much forklifts running about our sites. We're a safer uh, way to build. We're not working at height. We've got less trips and falls. We've got less manual handling. We're not fitting windows into holes in a building site. We're actually doing it in a factory where I've got a robot doing that in the, fa in the future, not a person. And then just assembling a whole wall to complete a window water type building in a day. These are all the skills and issues we're taking off. And the gentleman at the back asked about skills. What we're seeing is in the mainstream and opportunity is that in block work construction, brick and block, you're relying on a bricklayer. There ain't many bricklayers going around. They're actually a depleting resource over time. They're an aging workforce that's reducing. We need new ways to do it. So timber frame allows us to do that by taking that element off it. We still need a brick layer to then put the bricks round about it. So he's more efficient. He can do five or six houses a week rather than three or four. He's not having to lift heavy steel lintels or lift heavy block lintels because the shell's there. He's building to a template. So in terms of getting more people and de-skilling the process, it's about using the skills we've got, extending the shelf life of the workforce we've got, 
and actually encouraging new people into it where they don't have to work on a, on a muddy field as much as they need because half the building is already built for them. So our final sort of road map is about low carbon homes and designing those. So through our um, project, AMCH, working with our partners, we've developed a pre-configured book of affordable homes that are net zero carbon, 18 house types, all designed to housing for various needs or NDSSS standards in England. Um, fabric first, heat pump ready with a low U value um, external wall uh, solution, 55% PMV uh, uh, as minimum, all type approved and free to use. So as an SME who doesn't have the skills, who doesn't have the technical people to help them, they can actually come and just use under a license agreement our range of house types with our regional architect who can then build them, whether it's in rural highlands of Scotland or whether it's in the outskirts of London. Configure them together, elevate them to suit the materials in that local vernacular. We've got a placemaking manual that goes with it to ensure that the places we're building are fit for purpose, three elevational styles, uh, and are already type approved by NHBC, endorsed by hopefully Homes England in terms of funding, and potentially supported by Lloyds Banking Group in terms of development finance and mortgage finance. Those are the type of solutions, part and book, standardization, DFMA, that makes our life making things a lot easier, makes the developer's life a lot easier where they've got an off-the-shelf off pre-configured solution. So first to market, spring next year, uh, we'll have a solution for those who'd be interested in looking at that solution where they actually can just take the whole house solution from us, because we are a developer as well as a supplier. And finally, um, just to talk about our um, ambitions as a developer, we are currently building the largest residential development in Scotland at Countess Wells on the outskirts of Aberdeen. It's a 3,500 unit uh, development with mixed use, education, community, food production, retail, and the current largest uh, public park built in Scotland in the last 100 years. A huge degree of biodiversity involved. We call it a 20-minute neighbourhood to get connectivity to uh, wider uh, connections within uh, the Aberdeen area. And we believe this can be really a bedrock for the future model for net zero carbon living. So in our roadmap to net zero carbon, we believe we can do some large-scale demonstrations at Countess Wells and Aberdeen we can actually start to play around with the technologies in the home and also the grid readiness. We're speaking to some of the guys from Synergy about homes will become electrically driven. So you're going to put an EV charging point in, you're going to put a heat pump in, you're going to have PV on the roof, you're going to generate a lot of power and that power needs to go into the grid. So we've got to look at smart grids, we've got to look at the utilities infrastructure that support that system and how we manage that system going forward because it's fundamentally different to what we're currently doing uh, in our development. So in our development at Countess Wells as part of our sustainability strategy, we're looking to do some innovation demonstration uh, in, in our future on that development because of the scale and the opportunity. We think that could be a blueprint for Scotland in uh, net zero carbon uh, outlook. But we need help in that. And my last two slides um, is about innovation. So it's great to see the innovation center here because as a business, these things are really difficult to do. They cost us money. There's no certain outcome. You probably get it wrong more times than you get it right to get to the point where you can then commercialize it. So we need support from government. My call would be to government to fund businesses who are looking to develop um, uh, these types of solutions uh, to offset and de-risk the cost of innovation, which is considerable, so that we all learn and we all benefit from that uh, project and we do it in a collaborative R&D manner. And the key thing with that is to make sure that we don't create unattended consequences. We don't want to build homes that are not fit for purpose in 10 years' time, that are going to be overheating, that are going to be pulled down because they're, 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 not, they're not durable enough, etc. They create health and well-being issues because they've not been thought through, etc., etc. So we have to go through this process. So innovation is fundamental. And uh, with our work at Countess Wells and maybe working with the Innovation Centre and others, we'd like to do more. So from our point of view, to finish off, our conclusion as a developer and a supplier uh, who wants to mainstream the use of timber for at least one in two homes in the UK, timber is the only real, viable, doable, reliable, 
proven solution at this point in time. And we believe using timber as a renewable material will ensure that the homes and the places we create for our people and our planet will be loved by everyone. Thank you very much. Stay for questions, stay for questions. Well, that was really interesting and lots of good takeaways, I think, for everybody in there, Stuart. Thank you. Um, some of the takeaways from, for me were I love your products, people, planet approach, and I think everybody should be putting that uh, at the heart of their business. And now, you know, as usual, you have always been sharing, you know, a lot of your learning, you invest in a lot of research and development and demonstrators and really share that with wider industry. So the rest of Scottish industry and timber frame sector in particular and uh, down south can, uh, you know, can pick up from a lot of your learning. And I think now to be, uh, you know, developing and launching a pattern book with your own placemaking manual for low carbon homes and low carbon, uh, low carbon living is a real, I know it's licensable <laughs> as opposed to free, but it's still, uh, you know, a, an excellent knowledge uh, sharing opportunity for the wider sector. So, what about the rest of you? Do you have any questions for Stuart that you would like to ask before lunch? I know the questions are sitting between you and lunch, but only for a minute or two. David? Hi there. Uh, this last year, the, there's been a, um, a Scotland's Climate Assembly, which was a group of 100 citizens uh, chosen randomly like a jury. Um, one of the 81 recommendations that they made was that all new housing now should be built to passive house standards. And, uh, and complementing that, they also recommended uh, Enerfit, the, the um, retrofit equivalent. How close are you and what are the steps that you're going to need to take um, in that Aberdeen uh, project? Because during the, these, this build-up period, um, you're going to be needing to change them. Yeah. And, and I suppose, what's, the, what's stopping you going for a passive house now? And then you don't have to have a big, a big um, heating system and so on. Uh, well, yeah, we've, look, uh, we've uh, looked at passive house a lot. So uh, current home, you know, passive house is 15 kilowatts per square metre, so as a sort of metric that they use. Um, and obviously very tight air tightness levels. They introduce mechanical ventilation, heat recovery systems. So these are quite technically complicated systems to both build and maintain in a mainstream solution. Um, research we did recently with um, MBHR homes that we built suggested that the actual occupants in the home weren't using them correctly, they weren't maintaining them, and actually the, the products were failing, and we had to rip some of them out and replace them with more contemporary standards or ventilation systems. So we definitely believe in a highly efficient, energy efficient fabric. We're just not sure if you need to go as low as passive house. So our view is that we could get to something like 25 to 30 kilowatts, which is half of what it currently is in a, a domestic home, uh, with an air tightness around about three, um, with a good U value of like 0 0.18, 0 0.17, um, to give a good fabric design, still with some natural uh, purge ventilation going through, possibly with a DMEV solution, but avoiding maybe that additional step to heat recovery. Because obviously you're introducing an electrical system and to recover the heat. So you're in increasing the heat load onto that sort of style. So I think we got a solution, I believe, that is doable en masse at that level. And if we get to that first step in stone, then maybe in 10, 15, 20 years, ultimately the end goal might be passive house. But I think it's quite a difficult step to go there straight away. And therefore to take the market with us and our consumers with us and the builders with us, uh, we need a gradual progression. So at Countess Wells there, we think we could get to something that we would call near passive, you know, without it necessarily being passive because it might be a stretch too far commercially and they may have a legacy come back to us that you know, we don't want as a developer, we want to make sure our homes are robust and fit for purpose. Thank you. Contentious as it may be, I don't know. <laughs> um, anybody else with a question? Thanks very much for your presentation, Joe. Uh, somebody else asked a question earlier about supply and about how you, where your timber comes from, trying to get it locally sourced and all that. How does, 
Uh, I know it's, it must be difficult you know, building so many houses, but how does Stuart Mill do it? Well, we're a, we're a big producer and buyer of timber, and uh, we know Andy and the team very well, um, but we do buy a lot of homegrown uh, product. So all our floorboards are homegrown, all our joists are homegrown, uh, all our sheathing materials. So the OSB is from you know, um, Norboard, um, uh, chipboards from Norboard, etc. So those kind of engineered components we're buying in in bulk. Uh, so that supports that community. Our structural timbers we use for predominantly wall panel production uh, are typically Sweden and, and Finnish materials. Currently, we are looking at Canada because of the price issues in, in the marketplace. And there's a simple reason for that. They have the volume, they have the quality, and they have the price point that's acceptable to us at the moment. If we ever got to the same in the um, homegrown marketplace, where we had the volume that we would require at the price point and at the quality that, that we require, that would be good. So we are using C16, um, you know, 38 by 89s, C16, 38 by 140 timbers as, as, a, as, a, as a bulk producer. Uh, and like we'll take three truckloads a day into our factory, you know, just to give you some scale. Um, 75,000 cube a year. Um, so yeah, the opportunity is there um, for that. Um, but at the moment, we're doing a bit of both. Because um, we need surety of supply, we need guarantee of volume coming in. Um, the uh, Swedish uh, market, even with the price rises we've seen in timber in recent months, um, have supported the UK in supplying materials in. Uh, we like the idea of, of sort of reusing um, some of the homegrown timber into more high value materials. So the sort of poorer grade timbers that we've got in the UK can be repurposed into a high value CLT product. Um, but we're not in the CLT game for low rise housing. We are still of the view that a timber framed method of construction for low rise is the most cost effective method of construction. Anybody else? Is that us then? Okay. Right, lunch time. Uh, lunch will be served in the cafe, which you'll be delighted to know is inside and a bit warmer in than here. So it's just through the, the factory doors. They're into the main building and on your left. Um, the coffee truck's still open. Uh, if any of you still have a voucher, otherwise it will be, uh, you will need to um, pay. Um, but it's, it's still open and in the yard if you're wanting something in addition to your lunch. Uh, use the lunch time, although we've got tours obviously starting at half past three, which we hope you're joining, still use the lunch time to, you know, walk around the exhibits. There's various screens and videos and, uh, you know, information on them. There's the hideaway cabin and Balfour Beatty's uh, innovation um, a pod outside in the yard as well. Um, and also today we've got a wood miser display, which you maybe heard earlier, we had to get them to switch it off, it was a bit noisy, but uh, they will uh, demonstrate the wood miser uh, in the yard for anybody that's interested. And so it's, it cuts timber, um, you know, it's quite a neat machine that cuts timber into uh, any dimensions, um, almost automatically. It can create uh, boards, beams, posts, shingles, uh, depending on how it's programmed, but it's quite a versatile piece of kit and it's been demonstrated out in the yard. So um, if I could ask you to come back for 1.30, um, and then you'll hear for, uh, from um, Andy Leach from CONFOR, Cities for Forests, and also the Transforming Timber Project. And just before I go, uh, a pair of glasses has been found underneath one of the seats if anybody's lost their glasses. All right, I've got them up here. So thanks very much, and I'll see you all at half past one.
Right, everybody for the Wood for Good conference, if you can come and take your seats, please. The session will be about to begin. For good delegates, please make your way to the factory event space.
Would all the Woodford Good delegates please make their way to the event space in the factory as soon as possible? Everybody will just get started and we'll probably have a few stragglers uh, come in as uh, the afternoon progresses. So welcome back, everybody. I hope you enjoyed your lunch. And I would like to make a special welcome to all of the Transforming Timber delegates that have joined us this afternoon from this morning's workshop. So we've had a great morning session here in the Wood for Good um, conference with some really interesting speakers. And we're going to kick off this afternoon with two speakers, one Scott Francisco, who is co-founder of Cities for Forests, and then Andy Leach um, from CONFOR. So Scott, would you like to make your way onto the stage, up to the podium? And I'll give you your big aplomb welcome. I've had some so, with me. <laughs> good. So Scott uh, is a Canadian. He is a designer, strategist, advisor and educator who assists organisations and governments as they envision new futures and co-design their infrastructure and culture systems. He has expertise in the fields of architecture and urbanism, systems thinking, organisational and community development, natural environments and sustainability. His firm, Pilot Projects Design Collective, is based in Montreal and in New York City. And he's the co-founder and director of the Cities for Forests Global Network, which you're going to hear a bit about today, and two communities of practice, Wood at Work and the Future of Forest Work and Communities. So there's a whole list here. It says Scott has a passion for research and teaching and holds architecture degrees from MIT and the University of Toronto. And without naming all the universities that this fantastic man has worked at, he has um, taught at a number of universities across um, North America. He speaks and writes regularly on urban sustainability and spends a lot of time in his workshop with his sons, making useful objects from wood salvaged in the city. So Scott is going to speak about the Sustainable Wood for Cities platform and the Partner Forest Programme as a, a specific examples of social forestry. So Scott, without any further ado, take to the floor. Thank you, thank you. It's, uh, it's fantastic to be here surrounded by all this great, uh, this wood, this wood work, and, and most of all these people, uh, you all, who are part of this movement uh, to explore how to co-create a better world, which is the... Uh, uh, subheading of Pilot Projects Design Collective, my company, co-create a better world, and we have to do that together. So um, I thought it would make a dramatic entrance with a pile of wood and a, and a cup of coffee, and sort of, why is this guy carrying wood and coffee around? Um, some of you have seen me out at the Partner Forest coffee truck. Um, and really, it's, it's all about uh, 
forests, climate, working together in cities and creating change. And I'm gonna just tell you about my story and, um, and hopefully just bring you into that story and we'll have some time for conversation afterwards. So speaking of stories, uh, I grew up surrounded by wood. Um, this is a, a shot of my mom uh, at our kitchen island, which is made of solid black walnut, which my father made before I was born. And I grew up every day, uh, you know, while I lived at home, um, having uh, food prepared on this beautiful piece of wood that was assembled from a tree that my dad had to cut down because it had died, and it was like, what are we going to do with this wood? So wood is just sort of part of my, part of my DNA growing up, and, and I grew up in Canada. I'm from Canada. Uh, Canada is famous for canoes that are mostly traditionally made of wood. So it was just wood just was part of the way of being in Canada. And um, I became an architect, and it felt like a very natural thing to do. I loved, I learned to love making things, designing things. I got to build in this beautiful landscape of Canada uh, with, this, with these gorgeous forests and water lakes and, um, and, and make buildings. And so I found myself in my early 20s as a young architect building buildings mostly out of wood, which I loved. But um, it was after a long journey and I moved to New York City, had an opportunity to work uh, in New York, uh, working on larger projects. And my favorite place in New York City was the Brooklyn Bridge. And the Brooklyn Bridge has a wooden boardwalk that stretches over the East River. And almost every day I would walk across this boardwalk, and one day I thought, wait a second, now where is this wood from? Uh, I knew it was a tropical hardwood. And that question took me on a whole new journey of thinking about design and sustainability. I quickly found out that that wood was Greenheart coming from a forest in Guyana, and it raised a lot of questions for me about what happened to that forest? I grew up loving forests as much as I grew up loving wood. And um, that, that journey is what has brought me here today. So I became, years later, the co-founder of Cities for Forests. And Cities for Forests is an organization which is bringing cities into this conversation through, this, through the councils and the decisions that those councils are making about where products, and in particular wood, uh, are is sourced from. We work, Cities for Forest works at three scales. We work at the inner forest scale, which is the trees and forests within the city boundaries that municipalities have direct control over. The nearby forests, which would be anything within a few hundred kilometers, and which are very important for recreation, watershed, biodiversity. Um, and, and in particular, we work in the faraway forests. For cities, the faraway forests are forests anywhere in the world. And we know more and more every day how important these forests are for conserve it for, for our climate, number one, for biodiversity, number one, uh, for people's livelihoods um, and social, basically social flourishing on our planet, also number one. Uh, there can't be a number two in this. So these forests are vital to our survival. They're vital to our survival in cities. So bringing that conversation into cities became uh, a real passion, and we brought many organizations, funders, and collaborators into this. Uh, very quickly, there's a few tools that we've created, and I'll get into the, a few of these in detail, uh, that we're using to engage municipalities in this conversation. Uh, we recently launched a call to action, which we've had about 75 cities from around the world sign on to, um, to declare the importance of this and raise this to, this to national government levels so that the city's voices are being heard by national governments. Uh, we've created a publication, uh, which is... Really, it was supposed to be launched before COP. It's coming out kind of any day now. It's consolidating the global research on forests and how forests relate to cities and the co-benefits that cities and forests share together so that anyone in a decision-making role can have access to that information. Um, we've got forest footprinting tools. How many, how many hectares of, of tropical forest does a city like Glasgow, um, like Toronto or Montreal uh, consume just through their daily, their daily uh, business? Uh, the food and products that, that a city uses. But what I'm going to talk about today are two programs, the Sustainable Wood for Cities and the Partner Forest Program. So um, I guess going back to the question of what are the relationships, uh, we know now that cities are responsible for the majority, the vast majority really, of climate emissions. Uh, it's well over 70% that cities are directly responsible for. We also know that just tropical forests alone are responsible for somewhere between 8 and 10% of emissions, direct emissions, okay? But if you actually look at the restoration potential and, and just, just stopping 
Deforestation, you get up to about 30%. It's an incredible number just through tropical forests. So we're looking at that and saying, how do we bring these two things together? How do we have cities and forests talk to each other, learn from each other? We are in this relationship, and it's, it's unavoidable that cities and forests are in a relationship with each other. It's now a matter of how do we get it right. Um, when it comes to wood, wood is one of the products that represents that flow. And we'll talk about specifics later. But uh, we, were looking, we, we keep asking this question. If we, if we want to use wood, which I do, and everyone in the room here, I think, says, yes, we think wood is a great material, how do we know how to do that sustainably? And it's not an easy question to answer, as it turns out. Um, we do know, and we've heard from, from almost all the presenters today, to sort of show different views on how wood shows up in the city. More and more, the cities are the place where this conversation is happening. Wood is becoming an urban material. For many, you know, for, for the last century, it's essentially been a non-urban material, and it's becoming an urban material once again. But even, you know, when wood was, you know, we didn't have mass timber buildings to discuss, we were still building in cities with wood. We were building boardwalks and benches and components. The wood was still there. It's now coming to center stage. So, I got this email yesterday uh, from one of my hundreds and hundreds of wood collaborators, CBC, that's the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, much like the BBC. Uh, this is an article from two days ago. The conversation about sustainable wood is ongoing. It is a debate. It is a, of, of growing concern and growing awareness. So CBC's article from a couple days ago is, we're not getting this calculation right. We don't know the answer, we think we know the answer, but we don't know the answer to the carbon footprint, the true net carbon footprint of wood. Um, Canada is very wrapped up in this, of course, massive forestry sector in Canada. And um, how many here have, have heard of Michael Green, architect? Okay, a few of you. So he's, he's a prominent Canadian, young Canadian architect a little bit like Andrew Waugh, who's leading in the design um, sphere of building in mass timber. So he's been a great voice for mass timber. He, uh, who's, a, who's a friend and a very trusted colleague, was in a debate on CBC about two weeks ago with uh, a, a forestry expert, John Palmer, who's also a friend. These guys were going at it like, uh, what's well, a good analogy? Anyway, they were about to fight. They were on the radio, so they couldn't get physical, but it was getting, it was getting to that point. Up on this particular topic. What is the relationship between uh, wood demand, increasing wood demand, forests, and carbon? Now, if two of the most trusted people in my network are fighting live on the air about this topic, what I can say is we don't quite know the answer, and I'm sure about that. Um, I'm sure most of you have been reviewing the research, and there's, there's many great papers out there that we refer to all the time. Probably we're using some of the same scientific li literature. Um, and that literature is divided. There's a spectrum of what is the relationship between increasing wood demand to supply wood for these beautiful urban buildings that we know we need to do. And we know we need to figure out how to do this to, get, to wean ourselves from fossil fuel oriented construction. But we don't necessarily fully understand the impacts of that yet. So one of the questions we asked to this is how do cities, if cities are gonna be active players in this, if they're really gonna be making these decisions, if city councils are gonna be specifying wood for uh, say public housing as one sector, how do they know how to do that well? And when you look at the supply chains, for the most part, you have to admit it looks a bit like this. By the time you're getting the wood into your building, the idea of exactly where it came from has become quite obscure. Now, I have to say that's one of the reasons I love the homegrown Scottish timber proposition because it brings that closer to home. It looks a little bit more like this. So this is where we need to be moving towards if we're going to be able to answer the question of, is our wood sustainable? And that is creating more direct and more transparent connections between the source of the wood and the use of the wood. The source of the wood being the forest, taking the entire ecosystem of the forest into consideration the people that are there, and then all the other actors in the supply chain so that we can confidently answer these questions. But even more so, and I may remember the question I asked to Andrew when he was up here is, how do you make that connection really powerful, emotional, real, and tangible to the consumer? 
And I think that is one of the great challenges before us. And actually, it's a really fun challenge to solve because it's not that difficult. People love wood. They love to talk about wood. Um, so there's an opportunity there to make this connection uh, mutually beneficial so that the folks in the forest side and the folks in the, in the, um, the urban side are talking to each other. So what is sustainable wood? We've identified, we've created a platform, it's in process, and we'd love to invite all of you here to, to have a look at it and participate. We've identified four categories that determine uh, uh, sustainable wood. One is what are the impacts on the forest? A huge topic, but still important just to single it out. What is the net carbon storage? Not easy to answer either, but very important if we're going to talk about wood and climate. The other is the CO2 comparison with other alternative materials. You can't make a comparison if you don't know what you're comparing with, right? So these two things are different. How do you understand the net carbon? How do you compare it to other materials? And then very importantly, and we can sometimes forget about this one, but we shouldn't, and that is the social impact and the social benefits. So through that, we've created a platform to evaluate different sources of wood. And the reason I brought these pieces up here is, here's a piece of wood from uh, tropical rainforest in Guyana. This is the material that the Brooklyn Bridge Promenade is made of. It's Greenheart. Amazing wood growing in a natural rainforest. Should we use this wood? What, how do we know? How do we know if we should use that wood or not? Uh, of course, here's some of your uh, Scottish homegrown wood that you've used in some of these buildings. And I won't lift it up right now, but there's a piece of ash that's being cut from a tree, a local tree, to Glasgow, that was a tree that was destined for um, decomposition, and now we're putting it into use as timber. So we've identified eight pathways. Um, before I show you what that looks like, I want to say that this is a this is a platform that's been developed with a community of practice. Um, three, in fact, and there's others that have participated. Uh, Wood at Work uh, involves hundreds of people in the sector, and we've had conversations over the years to co-create this framework for evaluating wood sustainability. Um, so what we identified is that there's pathways. You could sort of, you could say, well, I wanna do something good with wood. I wanna, I wanna make sure it's sustainable. Um, I'm gonna use local urban trees. So does that sound like it would be sustainable trees that maybe the city is having to cut anyway? New York City, for example, take a guess at how many tons of, quote, wood waste they dispose of every year in tonnage. 40,000 tons every year of wood waste just into the rubbish bin. So if you can put that wood to work, you can think, well, that's got to be sustainable, right? So that's a pathway. Another is certification. If we can certify rigorously, we can actually create parameters and structures to follow. So um, I'll just quickly read through them. The forest certification, social forestry, working with communities, this is where this is from, um, that are doing forest conservation at a high level. Making sure you specify the right species and grade, lesser known species, lower grades, reducing the pressure on forests. That's another pathway you can take. Choosing where the wood is from. Strategic geography is about really determining what is a good place to source your wood from because we know there's some bad actors out there regionally. We know there's some bad, bad actors countrywide. And we know there's some places in the world that are actually putting parameters around forestry and production that are really doing a good job. Let's reward those groups to help them continue to do that good job. Local and urban wood I've mentioned, reusing wood. That's got to be sustainable, right? It's got to be sustainable if you're taking a piece of wood that was destined for the trash and you're putting it to use. High efficiency production is how much wood are you able to take from that forest and turn it into a long life wood product? So I'll put a number out there. If the number is only 25%, that's coming from your forest and making it into a 50 to 100 year building, is that really sustainable? And all the rest of it, the other 75% is going into paper cups or biofuel or decomposed matter on the forest floor, is that sustainable? It may not be. And then the last one is net carbon accounting and that's our ability, and this is where we really have to co-create now, our ability to accurately calculate the true net carbon potential of, a piece of, of any given piece of wood. Um, so I'll show you how we put this to work with a few different examples. So we've actually done some work here in Glasgow with woodworker Paul Hodgkiss, who is actually here. I think he's out of the wood miser mill. He has been restoring the battlefield rest. How many people know of this famous landmark in Glasgow? 
uh, a wonderful little restaurant now. Uh, it's being restored for probably the, at least the second time in its life. And they chose a wood for the balustrades that had to be replaced. Um, they ended up choosing a wood before we got involved. Uh, it's it's um, eucalyptus from, from Uruguay. So we went, used this tool to evaluate the sustainability and show that this plantation forestry that was being done in Uruguay actually had reached a very high level of sustainability, not just going by what they said on the website, but really digging into that history and we were able to give them a, a really good stamp of approval on this particular type of wood. Another one is a, is a, is a gardens project in, outside of Philadelphia, um, and another is the two cities that, were, that are using this. So for the bench, the bench from Longwood Gardens, this is a company that came to us and said, well, we've got a few different options of wood that we're looking at. One is thermary, that's thermally modified ash. Uh, Greenheart from Guyana, that we actually suggested Jara from Australia, and Kebony from New Zealand, which is a modified uh, radiata pine. How do we know which one is best? They came to us and said, we want to do the best sustainability we can uh, with our choice, and we worked through this process. And this is sort of what it looked like. We, we used each of the pathways. This is where it kind of gets interesting, and that is these pathways are not independent, they're interdependent. So you can have certified wood that also comes from a social forestry project, right? So FSC certified plus from a community. So in this case, this is the Green Heart from Guyana, uh, one of the best social forestry programs in the world, showing conservation benefits, also FSC certified, also a species and grade selection possibly, um, is it a strategic geography? And each of these has a, a whole system to evaluate, uh, basically a numerical rating system. Give yourself a, a zero, a one, a two, or a three for each of these categories and sort of add them up. And this is a self-evaluation tool. Um, it doesn't give you a kind of an official stamp. It just shows you uh, uh, what you're actually dealing with when you're looking at these multiple choices. And so the Partner Forest Boardwalk, a little sample of which is out beside our truck, uh, is actually, it's Pukte, it's a timber from um, Central America, and it comes again from a, a concession management program that is showing the best forest conservation rates compared to even strict preservation in the region. So we know that by buying timber from this community, you're helping to conserve that rainforest with all of the benefits of biodiversity, carbon, and, and social benefits. Doesn't mean that the timber Pukte, here it is here, it doesn't mean that this timber itself is always good because it could be someone next door is doing illegal logging and they're getting a piece of wood that looks just like this one. So this is where the relationships become absolutely critical. And then telling the story. So this, is a, this was an offcut from our, our, our lasering, uh, telling the story on the wood. We feel that's really important because we want people year after year to ask the question when they see this piece of wood, like, oh, where did this come from? Oh, this is this concession, Carmelita. I'm going to look them up. Actually, maybe I'm going to go visit them. Um, and actually, Andrew Waha, when we were talking at the coffee truck, said, Carmelita, and I don't know if Andrew's still here, I was there in my 20s. <laughs> he was actually in this concession. That's the kind of story that we want, because these are real places, real people, real forests, and real impacts. So that has to be made real to the end user and to the architects, like all of us who are specifying wood. And, and that's really the Partner Forest Program. So you can take the Sustainable Wood for Cities platform, which we invite you all to use. It's um, partnerforests.org is our site, and you can go there and, and, and get to the Sustainable Wood for Cities platform. The Partner Forest Program, taking it a step further. I talked about the Brooklyn Bridge. Well, what actually happened when I walked across the Brooklyn Bridge that day is, is 13 years worth of research and, and discovery and action and community building to look at how to actually do this right for New York City. Uh, we recently, two years, a year and a half ago, we won the New York City's competition for reimagining the Brooklyn Bridge. So our team that had been working together for all that time actually won the competition. Uh, a new mayor has, is being elected any day now in New York who's on board. We see, that this, we see this project is actually happening, which is creating a long-term relationship with the forest community that will be producing the hardwood planks in perpetuity for this bridge. Again, relationships, relationships, relationships. That's why we're here together. Uh, that's the biggest thing that we're going to take away from coming together here is meeting people, developing relationships, learning from each other. And we can do that at a global scale too because we don't have all the answers, but people that are actually in these forests, working these forests, they have knowledge that we don't have. And we have knowledge that they don't have. So that kind of mutual exchange is so critical. Um, 
Well, I think you've got the idea of the for Partner Forest program, but it's not just wood. It's also this cup of coffee from Intag Ecuador, the cloud force of Ecuador. Well, I have to tell you a little romantic story, and that is um, around the same time I was starting the Brooklyn Bridge Forest Project, a young lady um, named Sarah was doing her PhD research in Intag, um, and six years ago we got married on the Brooklyn Bridge after we met through a mutual connection. She's a forest ecologist, I'm an architect, bring those together and you get the Cities for Forest program. Um, so it's not just about wood, it's also about things like coffee. So that coffee is being grown by a community who is committed to cloud forest restoration in Intag. So you've got two choices when you're buying your coffee. You've got like business as usual coffee that is very likely involved in deforestation because coffee is one of the significant deforestation drivers in the world. And then you've got another coffee which you know is coming from a community that is making sure the forest is standing because they're growing it under the forest. <laughs> So they need to keep the forest standing. And these are the choices globally we have to make. Um, and that's what the Port Partner Forest Program does, is it brings those choices into the cities um, and helps deal with this problem again, which is that climate change is really a function of deforestation. I mean, one of the main drivers of, de of climate change is deforestation. Let's reverse it by making those partnerships. So put that into the city. Put it on the city hall front steps. Put it on every park bench. Any piece of infrastructure that you're building in the city with wood, make that story real. Make it creative. Cities are full of creative people. Artists, storytellers. Uh, bring that story into the city and have that become part of the identity of Glasgow or part of the identity of London. The mayor of London three days ago signed our call to action. Paris has, has uh, signed the call to action and they've actually made a commitment to tropical forests. So cities are starting to actually do this. This is becoming real. I want to see a groundswell where thousands of cities from around the world are all deciding that they need to have a relationship with a tropical forest, a positive, mutually beneficial relationship. Could be based on sourcing rubber or, or coffee or timber or other products, even climate uh, forest carbon credits, which is an emerging like, valid market as that gets, uh, becomes more sophisticated. Um, and the world should start to look like this, where the dots of cities and the dots of forests are starting to connect near and far. We understand, recognize, and invest in that kind of mutual relationship. Um, so that's really our program, Cities for Forests. We'd love, I'd love to talk to you more about it, and uh, I'll stop there and let's talk in a few minutes. Thanks, Scott. I think that will make all of us think. Um, I do like the uh, analogy of cities and forests talking to each other uh, and us really becoming, needing to have a much more transparent connection between the resources uh, and the cities. So you can sit there uh, because you and Andy will take questions after Andy's presentation. So this is Andy Leach, who's Deputy uh, Chief Executive of CONFOR. Um, and CONFOR is the Confederation of Forest Industries in the UK, and so it's very much the voice of the forestry and wood sector. Um, it supports sustainable forestry and wood using businesses through political engagement, market promotion, and supporting their members' competitiveness. And Andy, and all his wisdom, comes with 35 years of experience in the forest industry. So we're interested to hear what Andy's going to tell us this afternoon. Okay, thanks, Lucy. And I know I don't look as though I've been in the industry for 35 years, but, but, but believe I know I have. Um, uh, time's short by the looks of it, so I'm going to, in my presentation this afternoon, I'm going to touch on, give you a short introduction to Wood for Good, because part of my role in CONFOR is Director of Wood for Good, and our campaign manager, Sarah Virgo, is uh, sitting over here. So hopefully we'll speak to her later on about uh, what we're trying to achieve there. And then I'll go through an overview of the UK timber resource and supplies chains. I was going to touch on the global manifesto that we've been involved in, but there's not enough time, so I'll, I'll probably just dump that. Okay, um, so Wood for Good, uh, I think Stephen mentioned already, is very much a, a generic, okay, thanks, it's very much a generic ca uh, marketing campaign for the use of wood. We focus on promoting the design elements and the biophilic side of things. 
And um, our mo most of our main focus over the number of years has been on this carbon benefits. The campaign is co-owned by Swedish Wood and Confor and has been uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, that's mainly because Swedish Wood put a lot of timber uh, into the UK. And that's because we don't have enough in this country to supply ourselves. As part of our kind of COP26 service, uh, Sarah has brought together an interactive map so that illustrates where all the activity is happening in COP as far as forestry and timber. So if that's interest to you, pop onto the Wood for a Good website and uh, you'll be able to see where there's good examples of use of wood and where the activities are. We have our website, as you expect, um, with all the, the, the usual stuff. It's got case studies, animations. We've also got a life cycle uh, analysis database with data for about a dozen or 15 sort of generic wood products. And that really is to provide a service to people who want to create EPDs. So that's a kind of shortcut. So we've put a lot of money and effort into that. And we're in the process of updating. We we'll also do things in Scotland, like we um, promote the, well, we celebrate the design of wood in Scotland, and we have RIAS awards. And on occasions, we also do special projects, like this Modern Timber House uh, publication, which you'll see copies of in the foyer. For the last year or so, we've um, specifically focused on the carbon benefits of wood. And um, as you'll see here in the different banners at either side, our focus is on being very simple factoids about the, the kind of carbon benefits of forestry and wood. I'm not going to run through them because you can easily read them yourself and uh, time is short. So that's wood for good. So now let's look at and focus on um, the, the timber supply chain in the UK. But let's look at the, the whole global um, situation first. So drivers for future wood, it's, all, it's no rocket science. It's uh, which population is um, forecast to increase from 7.8 billion to 10 billion by 2050. Mm -hmm. Societies are becoming kind of more wealthy and healthy and urbanized, therefore there's greater demand for housing. And housing means more use of wood and wood products. And of course, well, in COP26, we're seeing the fruits of this. It's now, it used to be we were promoting this, but now it's a fact that sustainably managed forests and wood in construction is good for climate change. So there's going to be huge demand, and it's been forecast that demand for wood is going to double or even triple, as the, double, the WWF said in 2015, uh, for wood across the world. Now, that is fantastic if you're in the, the timber industry and you're a, a forest owner. Or is it? Because if you think about it, from a UK uh, perspective, we are the second largest importer of wood products in the world, believe it or not, only second to China. 80% of our wood products we use are imported. So if competition is going to increase and increase by 2050, are we really going to get access to that material? So we're really going to have to invest more and more to grow our own, own, own material. And when you look at... Um, the kind of forest cover in Europe is 46%. UK is only 13%, so you can see why uh, we're looking to, uh, why we're in a position where we have to import material. Now on the table there, um, just one or two figures to take note of, and I'll refer to them later on. So Sonwood, we imported over 7 million cubic metres this year, or sorry, I should say 2020, and we imported over 3 million cubic metres of, of wood panels. So that 13% wood cover in the UK, even that, only 50% of that is softwood generating. The other 50% are broadleaves, and they're managed more for habitat management, etc., rather than, rather than timber production. So um, we actually only got, what, well, not even 7% cover that's given us productive forestry. What does that equate to in, in hectares? Um, there's over 3 million hectares, but again, as I say, only 1.4 million of that is actually uh, focused on softwood. Uh, 700,000 hectares of that is publicly owned, so that's what you used to know as the Forest Commission, 
uh, manage all of that. And then another 900,000 hectares is private sector. And the reason I brought that up is because that impacts on when the material comes to the market. The private sector will only put that material on uh, when prices are right. And therefore, it's difficult for the, the wood industry to forecast exactly how much timber is coming to market in any year. So these have created, all these circumstances, global demand, etc., have created new drivers for investing in, in woodland and timber in the UK. Uh, as you know, the UK government have in, announced that they are going to plant 30,000 hectares more every year by 23-24. What we're focusing on is asking them to consider, if you're going to plant 30,000 hectares, make sure there's a good percentage of that that's going to give us uh, productive output so that we can store more carbon in buildings like this uh, and substitute higher embodied energy products. Mm -hmm. From an economic perspective, um, there's opportunities to onshore manufacturing that already happens in overseas. You see examples here, CLT, and now we're moving hopefully to producing it here rather than overseas. There's a machine here that can produce wood fibre insulation, and there's another opportunity for us. So let's look at that and let's take advantage of it and uh, reduce our reliance on uh, imports. There's also non uh, construction potential as well that's happening elsewhere and that's biorefining and that may be something we'll be looking at in the future where we're breaking down these trees to give us other products, petrochemical based products to replace that and even things like clean hydrogen believe it or not you can make from wood you just have to make it cost effective So looking at the the overall inventory of uh, woodland area in the UK. This is a pie chart really just giving you a, a breakdown of the species. That's broadleaf and conifer. Um, the, the kind of quarter there, the chunk, is Sitka spruce. But the reason I, I put this up is it's just to illustrate that really when I'm talking day-to-day -day forestry, people talk about monocultures. Well, that illustrates we don't have monocultures across the UK. We might have it in patches in the hill, but overall, uh, we've got quite a breakdown of species. And in the forests in the UK at the moment, it's storing about one billion tonnes of carbon. But when we come down resolution to, to conifer species, even so, 50% of those conifers are spruce, Another 50% are made up of pines and larches and Douglas fir. The key thing here is about planting the right tree in the right place for the right purpose. And the reason we plant so much spruce is it's very productive, but it'll also grow anywhere, whereas a lot of these other species have to be very specific sites. So, for example, spruce will have a rotation length of about 30 years now, whereas pine is about 80 years. And spruce will give us 800 cubic metres to the hectare, whereas pine in some places only give us 250. But there is a place for these other conifers and they're very important, but uh, it was really just to give you a reason why we do focus a lot on, on spruce. Overall, the uh, calculation was made in 2015, uh, 2015 that there's about 360 million cubic metres of softwood standing at that time. I've put these graphs up really just to illustrate. So the top left-hand graph is basically the, the production levels, what's being felled each year uh, in the UK. And our forests are very, very young. It's not like Canada, where we've got these old, old forests. These are all plantation forests that have been planted over the last 50, 60 years. And as you can see, only in the, in the last 10 years, really, 15 years, we were moving up to 9, 10 million tonnes of timber per annum. Before that, it was three million, and that really didn't give us the opportunity to engage with the construction sector. And just by way of comparison, the, the other graph is, is the hardwood uh, production in this country, which is down well below a million, million tonnes, and most of that goes to firewood. So the next graph I'm going to show you is the, the one on the left here. That is basically a forecast of the, the wood fibre availability uh, from our softwood forest uh, for the next 50 years. Um, the, the, the marker there, the kind of purple marker, 
uh, illustrates 2019, and that illustrates what we actually felled, what we harvested from that um, potential. So it shows you there's a gap there where there's plenty of timber we're leaving. Um, that forecast is based on the sustainable cut that we can take. So that illustrates we're not even taking that at the moment. Some of you are certainly some of our um, timber industry colleagues are a bit alarmed when you look at the drop from 2030. So it's forecast to rise up to about 18 million cubic metres available and then drop down to about 12 by uh, about 2045. That, that's a bit alarming. But we're due a new forecast in the next month or so. And um, I don't think that's going to happen. And I'll explain uh, why. Because for the last 20 years, we have been planting what we call improved Sitka spruce. This was a massive breeding program that took place where we identified all the best performing families and bred from them. So it was the, the fastest growing, the lightest um, branching and the, the density as well. And we've just got into crops that are 20 year old uh, in the last few months. And it's illustrating on that right hand side there where you see the yield class um, uh, limits there. Our usual models we use are yield class 6 to yield class 24, but these new crops are already showing yield class 44. So that's been taken into account in the new forecast, and that's why I'm projecting that there'll be actually more fibre available than we thought, and also that that drop will not be in, in that place. That's what I'm projecting. I hope I'm, I'm right. <laughs> okay. This is a bit of a, a, bit, a busy um, slide, but again, it's really just to illustrate to you where all the, the markets are for our material. So when we cut that 1,000 cubic metres uh, from the site, 600 of it, that's the, the large proportion and the large diameter of the tree goes to the, the sawmills, and that's broken into material for the construction, pallet and fencing markets. And there's a small percentage at the moment goes to engineered wood products, etc. Uh, hopefully that will, that will change in, in the near future. When you cut a round bit of wood into square bits, you get chips, you get sawdust. That can represent about 35 to 40 percent of the material. And that feeds the panel board, it feeds the paper industry, and it feeds the energy industry as well. Um, m many of our new wood processing facilities actually use that, that sawdust to burn, to then, as we a circular economy, circularity, uh, to, to feed their kilns that heat and uh, dry the, the actual sawn wood that's graded for construction. The smaller parts of a tree all go to panel board uh, and, um, and paper. And yes, for the last kind of 10 years, the wood energy market has certainly grown. That's through government incentives. So it's about 2 million tonnes uh, is burned for electricity at the moment. And there are companies were trying to find ways to efficiently remove the, what we call the brash in the top. So that's all the branches and the stuff that's left after harvesting and burning that too. What's missing? Um, from that particular slide, and I'll put it in in the future, is a new stream that we have to be aware of and make much more use of, and that's recycled wood. Because timber is, it may be sustainable, it may be renewable, but it's still finite. So what we are looking to do is to extend the life of every bit of wood we can, and therefore many of our, our wood industry units are now looking to use recycled wood. And in fact, our panel board industry uses huge amounts. So it gives that piece of wood the extra life, extra life. So you might have a pallet wood, a piece of pallet that lives for 10 years. It gets repaired and repaired. It finally goes to disrepair. It can go into the panel board industry, go with panels, into a house, stored for 100 years, storing all that carbon. It's certainly been, when I showed that graph about the, the um, kind of rise in the production of our forests, that's been reflected in the investment that's happened in this country as well. And there's more than a half a billion pounds being spent in what I would call world-class um, wood processing facilities. And uh, that one in the slide there is uh, what is now called West Fraser. Uh, you previously knew it as NOAA board. That makes OSB. And they've had about £135 million invested in it in the last two or three years. 
So they certainly see a future in, in UK forestry. Focusing on the construction products, um, this is a kind of table showing the last three years' production of sawn wood from our sawmills. And this, in 2020 is the latest figure we have. We, we produced over well, about 3.3 million cubic metres. That's down in previous years, but it kind of reflects um, the impacts of COVID. When you take that sawn wood and look at the markets that um, is, is serviced by it, in 2020, there was actually quite a little dip. So in that yellow band is the construction side. So if you look at the far right, you'll see 20, only 27% of the sawn wood this year went to the construction industry. 43% went to fencing. But that reflects lockdown, everyone doing their gardens, everyone wanting to renew things. So that was where the demand was, so that's where the, the timber went. And just for completeness, we also produced about over 3 million cubic metres of panel board, OSB and chipboard and things. So we've spent a lot of money understanding the, the, the trees that we grow in this country. And uh, if you want to know what's about Sitka spruce, Scotch pine, um, the conditions we grow in, uh, what you can do with it, you can certainly find these brochures in the Forest Research website at those links. But it has enabled us to, to focus a lot on what is the structural capability of our species. And this slide really just illustrates that um, what we have found in, in this country, all our species certainly produce 100% C16 um, graded timber. Uh, some of them will give you C24, but you have to break that out. But in general, it's C16, and that's why we've tended to produce only that. Um, but again, that is, is fit for purpose. Because spruce is so predominant, we have looked at that um, even closer. So you look at three characteristics to, to grade timber, um, strength, stiffness, and density. And we found that British spruce has actually got, I should say, greater um, characteristics than C16 for strength and density. So Napier University helped us uh, understand that more. Um, what's the point? What's, so what? So it's got a density greater than, than C16. What can we do with that? Could we use that as marketing? Can engineers use that? So we did a, we've done, did a few studies, but here's one just to illustrate. This compares creating a Belfast truss uh, from using normal C16 to C16+. Plus. And then the guys at Napier came up with the calculation that if you use the C16+, plus, um, you could save 47% of the, the metal fixing. Sorry, I've got that jumping about here. Um, 47% uh, of the metal fixings, and you could save 34% on sector dimensions. So these are the kind of things we have to get across to engineers uh, using homegrown timber. It is actually used. I mean, people talk about, oh, we need to get more and more homegrown into construction. But it is used in large, large numbers. Um, all, all that panel board goes in. All the C16 material that we produce. Actually, maybe not a lot of it goes to new build, but it goes to repair, maintenance, and extensions and things. But there are companies in the, in the new build sector that do use it. And this is um, examples of two. Alexander Timber Design, who produce a, over a, at times over a thousand um, frames per annum. They, they uh, supply the mainstream builders. And then we've got companies like Macar Construction, who are more kind of niche, uh, and like the bottom left here. And, um, and they are using not just spruce, but all the other species as well. So they, they do exist out there. And I also heard, heard from Stuart Milne earlier, and that they are using that material too. So it is used. Um, it's just uh, maybe not at the scale that we would want or expect. But again, for me, I'm not really interested in replacing imported sawn wood with homegrown sawn wood because we illustrated that our demand is much greater than we'll ever be able to produce. So what I'm interested in, what we're interested in, is adding value to the, the fibre that we grow in this country. So in my previous role, um, 
I was uh, worked for Scottish Forestry or Forest Commission, as you, you would know it, and I commissioned a lot of work through Edinburgh Napier University, then latterly working in partnership with the Innovation Centre to look at where can we add value to homegrown timber. And we focused on a lot of areas, but these are kind of four recent areas. Uh, can we use more homegrown in off-site construction? We mentioned earlier that I think someone called it the elephant in the room, but retrofit, that's where we, we really should be looking at uh, using uh, wood and wood-based materials. So we had a look at the opportunities there. And um, the other one is wood fibre insulation. Why are we importing air from Poland and Austria when we can manufacture it here? And we've got a machine here to, to, to test that. And so we do actually have an active project that's looking at that now. And of course, the big sort of sexy topic of CLT that's been going for a number of years. And uh, earlier when Andrew was talking and showing you photographs of his uh, first building, well, it was only a year or two after that, someone, a chap called Peter Wilson, came to me and said, Andy, we need to be doing this with homegrown. And I, I, I looked at my laptop to see if I had a photograph to show you. So we immediately went to Napier. Uh, we created a project. But it really was real Heath Robinson to begin with. We were using an old press uh, in, in a farm um, shed. But we did create CLT and we did testing. And then eventually we got this fantastic facility that has enabled us to manufacture and test, if you like, industrial scale CLT. And you're going to hear a lot more about that in the next speakers. So finally, and in conclusion, I hope I haven't taken up too much time. So UK is the second largest importer of wood products, fact. Global demand for wood products is forecast to triple in the next 10, uh, 30 years. Therefore, this country has to act and we have to plant more and we, we, we've been told we are going to plant 30,000 hectares. But we have to make sure a good proportion of that is productive material. There's opportunities, we're seeing that, for off, uh, onshoring manufacture and creating new jobs. And that's going to enable us to store more carbon and substitute more higher embodied energy products. And for me, we have to put more effort into the reuse and recycle of wood because eventually we're not going to run out of it, but uh, it's, it's best practice to extend that life. So overall, for me, the outlook for the UK timber industry is pretty bright and uh, working in partnership with Innovation Centre and Edinburgh Napier is going to help us uh, get there. Okay. Excellent. Well, thanks for all these facts and figures, Andy, on the UK and global market position. Uh, I was thinking during that, I think we need to split into two teams now and have a game of timber pursuits so that we can test all our knowledge of what you've been telling us. Anyway, I think a really good point that Andy brought up is, um, it was saying that really, it's, you know, the goal is not to replace imported timber with homegrown timber, but to very much to look at adding value to homegrown timber and in some of the new opportunities that um, Andy outlined there. So we're going to ask you on the next Slido if you want to log on again. So those who've come from Transforming Timber, if you could log on to slido.com. Oh, is it already up there? The, the code is 803716. And the question we're going to ask you is, where do you see the greatest opportunity for scaling up the adoption of timber in construction? Is it public sector, schools, hospitals, community facilities? Residential, industrial, or commercial? Oh, it's moving, moving a little bit. Andy, what do you think the answer is? Oh, you can see it. Actually, I agree with it. I agree with it. Yeah. yeah. For some things. Is there not an all of the above uh, choice? <laughs> Scott, is that your answer? All of the above? All of the above, yes. Well, it'll certainly be interesting to see, uh, to see where it goes. But I think uh, through stimulation by the uh, public sector at the client end and equally um, through like, the supply chain development programme at Scottish government level, we should hopefully see the public sector being increased users and key users of uh, more timber and homegrown timber in the future. 
So we've got our panel uh, here before we move on to our next two speakers. Have we got any questions from the floor for Andy or Scott? Come on, Jane. Oh. <laughs> Hi there. Um, thank you both for the presentations um, this afternoon. They've been absolutely excellent. Um, I just wanted to ask Scott a very quick question about um, sustainable forestry in the rainforest. And does that mean that stops illegal logging? Or does it have an impact on that? And how do you manage that between the two things? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I'm going to link it to the question that this slide poses, which is about demand. Where, how is the demand distinguishing between, um, say, illegal rainforest wood and wood that is not? Um, because, like I said, the same piece of wood could come from an illegal deforestation scheme somewhere, or it could come from a community doing the right thing. Um, so it really is about those relationships. Certification is, is a big piece of that. Uh, FSC in the tropics is doing a great job and all the communities that we work with are certified, but there are some that are not and are working towards it. Uh, it's not only certification. Um, I think we always talk about like certification plus. So add the relationship on top of certification and then you have a, a very clear path to uh, the impacts of, the, of this particular sourcing. So adding value is a huge way to combat illegal um, logging because and adding value when the transparency is there. So when I know that I'm getting a piece of wood that is coming from a particular place and community, I should pay a bit more money for that, right? Maybe even quite a bit more money. And I think as things play out over the years, we're, that, that value is going to increase because we're going to be paying for carbon benefits. We're going to be paying for biodiversity benefits. Um, that's going to be working through the system. And that ideally is putting illegal logging out of business because if I can't prove to you that my wood came from a particular source, no one's going to buy it. Um, my link to this is how do we, what would be differentiating between these different categories? It's is there demand from residential? Is there demand from commercial? And where does that, how does that demand take hold and drive through the system? Um, and I think it's sort of the same question. How does the demand uh, you know, really sink its teeth into that, um, uh, that, that end scenario of, of social biodiversity and climate benefits. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, a couple there, Danielle. Here's, oh, over there, sorry. <laughs> okay. Hi, a question for Andy. It's Tabitha Binding from Temple Development UK. Um, yield class 44, Andy, looks really interesting and could be a real changer. Is there any indication on the strength factors within that yet? Yeah, the initial uh, work is that it's going to be the same. Um, what we might be looking at with a, a yield class 44 is maybe an option of re reducing the re rotation lengths. So that's what we're going to be looking at. If, so harvesting it uh, year 20, year 25, will it have the same percentage of, of strength? But at the moment, it's, it's looking very similar, so we're quite happy with that. Got two questions over here, I think. There's two hands up. My question for Andy. Uh, I notice our reliance on Sicta spruce heavily. Are you worried about any pests and diseases in that species? And do you have any like, backup plans? Yeah, well, I mean, as you probably know, I mean, many of our uh, species are actually under threat uh, in the UK at the moment. Um, and of course, we know, we know what can happen to, to spruce um, if that bark beetle. Uh, Ask a Canadian. Uh, yeah, exactly. So, yes, we are concerned. But um, it's about investing, and in, in if you're talking about a 30-year rotation, just if spruce is the thing that gives you that 800 cube to the hectare, then that's what you've got to focus on. Uh, and you've seen in the, the, the pie chart, there is a good split of species. The, the ironic thing, though, is um, you see 70% is Scots pine. Scots pine is under real threat with, with, with a, um, a pathogen, a larch. It's dying because, again, it's been attacked by a pathogen. Uh, so, fortunately, we have a fantastic forest research um, agency in this country, and they're certainly looking at 
resilience and resistant breed breeding uh, for these species. And there's actually a, a project, a collaboration um, with Oxford University, I think it's the University of Vancouver uh, and others, and they are looking at using genomics to breed resilience for spruce against the, the beetle, uh, which is, could be really a game changer. But that's not going to happen next week. That's going to happen in 5, 10, 15 years' time. So yes, we're all concerned, um, but we, we think the balance that we have at the moment is, is right. And, uh, but you, know, you can only know if something happens, then we'll, we'll deal with it. I think we had another question down there. Yeah. Yeah, just for Andy. Um, all going well, how long before we can um, shift from being a net importer and offset that imported wood with domestic product? Scenario. Well, I, I mean, with the work that we're all doing, we're, assu we're assuming that demand for timber in the UK is going to increase further. I've already shown that we're importing 80% of what we use. So I'm going to be honest, I don't think we'll ever be able to be self-sufficient. And if it is, it'll be 50, 100 years, and you would probably have to plant half of England, and that's not going to happen. But what we have to do is plant as much as we can to minimize the reliance, and also focus on adding all that value using the homegrown material and wood fibre. So we're sucking out all the economic activity as well as the climate change from it. So it's maximising um, uh, wood fibre growth, if you like. But working at it at the moment, I don't think we'll ever be self-sufficient, if I'm being honest. Can I add and ask Andy a question? So what I really liked about what you said is at the adding value part. So if you pair that up to what I've been talking about with the sustainable wood evaluation, you could say that the market is going to be coming to the UK for its timber because of the um, high quality and high sustainability value. So if you imagine, this is a, uh, a hopeful image, is that, that we're going to be more and more sophisticated in choosing wood products that come with the sustainability credentials and seeking out products that come with higher credentials. So perhaps people would source from the UK rather than Canada if it happens that mm -hmm. you're doing a better job of forest management and showing better carbon benefits, et cetera. Right now, we don't have that rating. We can't look at a piece of wood and say, you know, this has a net carbon value of, you know, um, you know, you know one kilogram per, uh, per kilogram of wood, or, well, it's certainly not going to be that. Is it a net emitter? Is it uh, neutral? But imagine in 10 or 15 or 20 years, when those kinds, of, those kinds of data are part of the, uh, the way that we buy wood, then the, com the competition is going to be for elevating um, yeah. those numbers yeah. and, and selling. So you may be, maybe that the UK is exporting wood to the highest buyer, <laughs> right? I mean, that could be the case. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Well, we did export at one point to Germany, which was yeah. uh, quite shocking and surprising. If I can add uh, what I should have said too, about 82% of, of the, the, the sawn wood that uh, we produce or all the products is certified. And, and I suppose the other thing um, I should have mentioned, and, and I still don't think it would impact on us being self-sustainable, um, but there's a m massive inventory of broadleaf woodland in the UK that is not managed at all for any production. And if, for example, uh, a market such as maybe wood fibre insulation or even biorefining came along uh, with a demand for material from those, those woodlands, then it might encourage those owners to manage them better and therefore produce more construction timber as well from broad leaves. But in reality, the focus has to be conifer because you're talking 30 years. If you're a broad leaf, you're 120, 140 year uh, rotation. Great. Thank you. Okay, we're slightly over time. Yeah, getting the nod up there. So I would like to thank Andy and Scott very much for their illuminating after lunch discussion this afternoon. Kept everybody awake after our... <laughs> and now I would like to welcome up on the stage, double trouble, Matt Stevenson, who's founder of Ecosystems, and Robert Hairstands from Enmite. Um, who are going to talk us through the Transforming Timber programme, which 
is part of the Innovate UK award that uh, Ecosystems, Enmite and CSIC won all around engineering the future of construction uh, and of which the Synergy House is one of the outputs. So they're going to tell us the bigger story behind the Transforming Timber project and how it's created the zero carbon smart home of the future. <coughs> we did a duet. <laughs> okay. you, hum you hum it. <laughs> no worries. Okay, um, thanks very much, Lucy. Um, just to point out that, yeah, as much as I work for the New Model Institute for Technology and Engineering uh, at present as part of a dual working role uh, within Manipur University, where I still uh, retain a position there, where I manage the Centre for Offsite Construction and Innovative Structures, and that has been central to the, the, the delivery of this. Um, let's just see if the clicker's working. Oh, there we go. Um, and let's see if this, please. And you'll notice that um, as much as Matt and I are doing a, a duet at present, it's with due mention also to, to Sam Hart, who's, yeah, there he is, there's Sam, because Sam was very much instrumental in, in pulling all this together with regards to the application and to, to Innovate UK uh, in order that we secured the, the Transforming Timber project. Um, how we want to present this today is um, very much about the role that Transforming Timber, the project itself, is, is is playing a pivotal piece in a much broader spectrum of, of work, uh, which is now incorporating NMITE as, as part of that, and also, by extension, a, a, a partnership which is involved with uh, Timber Development UK, which aligns in, in many respects with, with what Andy is saying, because ultimately, what we're trying to do here is add value to the, the local Scottish UK timber resource and maximise that value return by putting it into the, the built environment and creating a, a, carbon, a carbon sink. Uh, but it's part of a, a broader spectrum uh, in terms of, you know, it's always going to be a, very much a sort of blended a, approach. And it's really about how we maximise the utilisation of wood fibre for the, the delivery of the built environment. So we know, um, and this has probably been touched upon today, but we know that the UK is, also, is already one of the largest global importers of, of timber resource. And as I say, what we want to do is, is maximise the use of our local resource within that, uh, within that picture in order that we can lock the carbon in for, for longer. So it's not going to fences, pallet packaging or paper as, as first point of call because ultimately that returns carbon back into the atmosphere uh, too quickly. Um, what we want to do is use it for construction purposes. In terms of construction um, within the, you know, the UK, uh, the, the, sort of the major, one of the dominant forms of timber construction is timber platform frame. Uh, we're in Scotland, of course, uh, at, at present, and timber platform frame construction, uh, and if you saw the, the presentation from Stuart Milne Timber Systems earlier, um, is a predominant form of, t of timber construction, uh, or new build uh, residential construction uh, within, within Scotland. Uh, in about you know, 83 to 85%. Uh, and that averages out UK-wide uh, at 30%, right? So there's a huge market opportunity uh, within that uh, as, as that, you know, the opportunity for, for growth in terms of uh, housing, housing delivery. Um, one thing to note in there again is um, the new build market, the need for affordable housing delivery uh, and current sort of uh, necessity for that and, UK and government targets of about 300,000 uh, houses uh, per annum. Uh, however, that's nowhere near being met, uh, being met and indeed the, uh, the, the pandemic uh, you know, also put that on a, a, a further sort of downward, downward turn so that the, the housing delivery wasn't uh, being reached. So as a result, there's, there's going to be, you know, quite a, a positive upturn, you would suspect, in, in that area. Uh, and indeed, a, a lot of the, the major house developers are now moving away from the traditional forms and looking at, uh, you know, the utilisation of timber and timber platform frame construction. The, the, obviously, the emphasis of what we've been doing in timber, uh, transforming timber is around uh, uh, mass timber systems, uh, and not just cross slam uh, the the bonded products in, in terms of CLT and glue lamb, but also in terms of neolaminated timber and dual-laminated timber, um, so mass timber in the round. And that's, that's as Andy kind of alluded to in, the, in the, his presentation, is drawn upon a his, historic research base uh, from 
Edinburgh Napier University. So we've come quite a considerable journey indeed from when we put a, a veneer press in an organic farm outside of, <laughs> outside of Inverness uh, to, to, the, to the point now where the, with the Innovation Centre uh, with the vacuum press and what that, what that can do. So what we want to do is obviously mobilise mass timber construction so we can, we can add value to the resource. And kind of what's interesting is the tensions that are taking place in, in, that, in, in the market at the moment in many respects. So you have this government drive towards net zero carbon, um, you know, the, the need to deliver the built environment more sustainably, which then uh, focuses in on in timber as a, a mode of delivering that. But, you know, recently in, in London it's been announced, you know, in many respects a, a sort of ban on the use of combustible materials for for uh, residential delivery. So there's this tension that's taken place and we need to overcome uh, much, of that, much of these tensions and indeed use the information that's available to us to demonstrate how safe, durable, uh, you know, producing the built environment from timber is. Uh, you know, at one point in Hackney, Murray Grove, and Andrew Wall no doubt touched upon it earlier, was the tallest timber building uh, in, in the world using that form of construction. So the UK was trailblazing in that respect, innovative the innovative use of mass timber. Uh, that's since been well superseded in Mjostranet in Norway up at 18 storeys uh, has, has topped out. Well, so it's like, you know, around the world, we're seeing the commercialization of, of mass timber uh, taking place. And we're also seeing tall timber buildings and uh, other forms of, other forms of, of delivery. But the, the, in, in some respects, the UK has, has taken a reverse gear. And actually, what we need to do is dispel some of the myths around this using the work that's gone before in this country, as well as what's taken place uh, internationally. Um, so that's really about how we overcome things like the, the perceptions of utilising timber from a durability or, or fire performance uh, standpoint, uh, and, and call upon the, the research innovation work that, that's taken place. And in that respect, the UK does have a long heritage of timber construction, you know, which dates back to the likes of, you know, crook frames, etc. And even when we, you know, shipped, uh, you know, the Manning Cottage to, to Australia. So we have a rich heritage and we need to call upon that and use it in order to, to move, move forward. Um, COP26, of course, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, um, of which there's, there's too many to, to actually remember. So just taking it in a, a simple perspective and how we have to think about things differently. And one of the things that we used within the Transforming Timber Project application, indeed, was around um, how to think, uh, think about this differently in terms of delivery using this sort of five capitals model approach. So thinking about how we can maximise the use of our renewable natural capital, what that can do in terms of social capital, so that sort of biophilic design uh, approach, say, even in terms of so social well-being. Um, what does this mean in terms of uh, human capital and, and skills and culture? And indeed, uh, what this all plays out in terms of economic delivery and, and financial capital obviously has its, its place to play in terms of uh, commercialisation. Uh, and of course, manufacturing capital and how we can take more industrialised approaches. So timber obviously has a, a huge part to play in that. It is a natural renewable capital as long as we have good uh, forestry management practices. Ultimately, we spend 80 to 90 percent of our time in the built environment, uh, so it's important to, to deliver it uh, using the appropriate approaches for health and well-being. We need to uh, educate. We need people to understand what buildings and construction do in terms of carbon impact. Um, and not just um, the, the wider public, but even within our, our university bases where even you know, in civil engineering, steel and concrete are the primary materials that are taught. So we, we primarily teach the carbon intensive methods of construction for built environment delivery. And fundamentally, we, we need to absolutely uh, change that. And as I say, from a sort of financial uh, perspective and an economic driver, we need to maximise value return. But we also have to think completely differently about this in terms of business model and procurement approaches. Uh, so we don't think about just capital upfront cost. We have to think about whole life cost and indeed within that, the environmental impact of, of what we're doing. So timber in construction has a, a huge part to play in this. Uh, obviously, as the tree grows, it locks in carbon, maximising the value return of that within the built environment has a huge part to play. But equally, we have to think about the fabric performance uh, and in, teams, in terms of it being energy, you know, energy performance uh, and, and therefore reducing the, the carbon consumption uh, from, from those that are, that are utilising utilizing the building. And timber can absolutely respond to that. But we, we have to think of, of this also, and as you know, this is a, a, 
a piece of work that was published in the, the iStruct T, uh, so that we do things in a productive manner. Um, we have this piece around construction in terms of how construction uh, productivity is stagnated at best, and we need to accelerate that, the, the level of productivity, particularly around things like the housing need. But if we accelerate productivity using uh, carbon-intensive materials, then all we do is accelerate the, the, the climate crisis. So we have to obviously use uh, timber or naturally occurring materials for that delivery. But within that, we have to think about maximizing the value return. We have to think about circularity, so retaining the, the value of it. And we have to think about it all the way to end of life, uh, such that if it, at the very end of its life, it's perhaps using for uh, woody biomass and for fuel, and to that end, even think about carbon capture and storage. So we look, we are thinking completely about how we can decarbonize that, that value chain. Factory-based approaches, we're in the innovation factory, there've, there's been a, you know, a considerable investment in here, uh, and that, that's really about how we can use timber for the delivery of the built environment, but use it using, uh, or do it using sort of, uh, a factory or a, a manufacturing uh, thought process, so uh, you know, using a lean thinking and thinking about things in terms of how you can do them more productively uh, in order to, to uh, reduce waste. And that's not just about full volumetric turnkey solutions. That goes all, you know, it goes to that end. But equally, we have to think about, uh, you know, uh, precision engineered subassemblies or even pop-up factories on on site. Uh, so th things like the the wiki house system uh, and, and facet homes. So you have to think about the, the broad set, broad spectrum of factory-based approaches that we can use for delivery uh, and the various products that res reside within that. So in that regard, there is a, a vast array of timber products and, and solutions, and we have to think about this with respect to it being a, a product family uh, architecture, and, and correspondingly, how you can use that product family architecture and the digitization of it in order to respond to the, the given context uh, most optimally. So these are the, 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 sort of the, the, the new approaches and the, and the new mindsets that we need to introduce into the, the educational system. And with respect to that, obviously, a big piece that has to play uh, in this regard is, of course, you know, Industry 4.0 and digitization. And that's not just thinking about building information modeling, right? That's thinking about forest, in forest information management. It's then thinking about when it goes into the, the production process, it's thinking about enterprise resource planning, it's thinking about computer-aided design and corresponding computer-aided manufacture, and, there, and then moving that forward into the actual built environment uh, and the, the, the virtual building itself in terms of digital twin. And where you want to be with that is then creating a feedback loop from that uh, virtual asset, or from that actual asset to the virtual asset so that you can look at the predicted performance versus the actual performance. And ideally you have traceability of that all the way back to the, the forest floor so you can understand the full carbon credentials of, of what you've done. And there's a whole piece in there in terms of the interoperability of the, the systems and the traceability of all of that so that you can have true transparency in what you've done. But equally from that feedback loop point of view by embedding sensors, et cetera, within the building itself, then you can get a full understanding of, of how it's performing acoustically, structurally, thermally, even the health and well-being of the occupants. And that fundamentally helps us continue to optimize what we're, what we're doing and ideally future-proof uh, as we go forward, particularly given uh, you know, the climate agenda. So why aren't we doing more of this? <clears throat> well, there's real challenges and barriers at play. Um, we're dealing with a very uh, complex uh, landscape in terms of construction delivery. And as I say, we have to think about from the forest floor all the way through to the built asset. As you move through the sawmill, and then you look to add value to, those pro to that dimensional, dimensional timber. So you're using equipment, you're using adhesives, you're using fixings, you're adding insulation to it. Uh, you're there, and then you're incorporating uh, mechanical, electrical uh, into, into the end building system, right? And within that, you've, you've got the engineered timber products that you're making from the dimensional timber or the oriented strand board or the structural composite lumber or whatever it may be. Uh, and then you're moving that forward into that end built system and from a full, uh, to the full fabric of that uh, building envelope and ideally having it you know, highly energy performing. 
And within that, you've got the client who's making decisions. You've got that sort of traditional business model and procurement approach. You've got the main contractor who then subcontracts, and you have architects, engineers, cost consultants, uh, you know, building performance engineers, et cetera, all in the mix of that, right? And then you have those that influence that, uh, that full uh, supply chain uh, and landscape also in terms of going from your, your investors all the way through to your warranty providers and insurers. So it's very complex, and that's the landscape of what we need to educate uh, and upskill and reskill in order that we can, we can make the shift that we need in terms of using more timber uh, within, within construction. And as I say, that human capital piece and skills and culture are absolutely key to this. Uh, the sort of recent stats from the, the CITB saying that we need 350,000 full-time employ employees within the next decade to, to hit net zero carbon targets, right? Uh, and that's not including the reskilling and upskilling of those that are already within the system, never mind the general public and indeed the politicians, right? So there's a, there's a huge piece to play. And when we go out and speak to the industry uh, and others, what they're, what they're really saying to us now is it needs a change of approach, it needs a change of understanding, and what we need to develop is more holistic knowledge sets within the individuals and ultimately create a more collaborative culture towards construction uh, delivery. So we all know this sort of farmer modernize or, or, or die piece, right? Um, but ultimately, you know, uh, if we don't modernize, uh, construction will, will die. Well, that was what written uh, more than five years ago and we still, we're still trying to, to tackle that. Um, so with regards to sort of the, the BioSM sort of uh, accelerator piece, uh, I don't think that animation is fully working, but we'll not worry about it too much. Well, what we've been trying to do, I don't know if you've ever heard this a quadruple helix model. Uh, it's a kind of take on that. We were trying to bring together education, research, um, sorry, research, innovation, commercialization, and education, and bring that together uh, so that it's got a much more symbiotic relationship so that we can affect change at scale and create the, the right level of collaboration and do that through network effect also by working with the, the trade organizations and trade or, uh, associations so that we can get the information out there and also work with, the, with customers and early adopters in terms of how we instigate the, um, the value chain and, and value add towards something that we're calling the living lab. So if we take this, essentially what this says is if we take this sort of five capitals model approach, right, and you look at the convergence of the, the drivers that are within that, then it ultimately means that for the delivery of the built environment, you have to use more natural renewable capital. And if you look at the key drivers within construction and what needs to change, then if you take sustainability, culture, productivity, digitization, uh, and skills and the regulatory drivers and the convergence of those, then it essentially leads you down a factory-based approach. So that, by default, therefore, means that you have to use renewable natural capital and timber through a factory-based approach for, uh, for the delivery of the built environment and construction. And then the living lab piece is about th those living labs are essentially the built environment becoming the lab in itself where you have a feedback loop from it into the digital model so you can get that, that holistic understanding. So in terms of this, um, what, we've ha what we have in front of us is what's called a mega map, or that's what we've called it, uh, where we've looked at essentially the range of projects that we have underway uh, via the, sort of the, the partners involved in this, right? We have the sort of PhD research work that's been ongoing at Edinburgh Napier and how it's underpinning uh, the information that we've used uh, within the, the projects that we're now seeing live through the sort of commercial acceleration piece, working with the likes of, of, of MAP. And then we have the, the wood fiber uh, built environment, or wood fiber rich built environment work, which Andy Leach has spoke of. And then we have transforming timber, which is a sort of innovation piece. So if we think about that landscape and what you need to do to unlock it, to get the, the policy change, the regulatory change, what innovation do you need within that landscape to unlock that change? And then how do you cross that chasm to getting this stuff commercialized so it actually takes, takes place within the market? We then have to think about that educational piece and in that regard, what we need to do via timber technology, engine design from an upskilling perspective. And ultimately, uh, what I'm currently working on uh, through the to establish the Centre for Advanced Timber Technology as part of this uh, collaborative landscape. So just to get, give a feel for it, we have, a, a, you know, we have five PhD uh, PCs currently mobilised at Edinburgh Napier. Uh, looking at things such as design for manufacturing assembly, disassembly, and reutilization, how you can collect data from uh, the, the virtual assets and look at the data flows and dashboard and all of that to make that information more transparent. 
And then even things from a technical perspective, uh, as you look at uh, engineered products and how you can, uh, if, you're, if you're stretching the limitations of those and moving out with some of the boundary conditions, what does that mean in terms of the structural performance criteria, in terms of not just the ultimate limit state, but the service li serviceability limit state, uh, and what that means in terms of dynamic, dynamic response. And of course, that's the sort of underpinning research through the PhD studentships, but then we also move that forward and use much of that talent to map into the, the industry requirements. We've touched upon the mass timber research work that we've been doing, and that's not just technical, it's looking at market, uh, looking at the, the market piece to understand some of the, the, the commercial requirements so that we can ultimately uh, embed that in what we're doing and be able to respond to it. And, and also looking at things like the homegrown uh, demonstrator, so how we can collect information, build it into digital models, and see what impact uh, it has in terms of using more uh, UK-based resource uh, within these built systems. And also, what's good about the digital piece is look at what that means in terms of scalability. So you can do it for one house, but what if you do it for 150, 300, or 3,000, and what impact that would have. And equally, that, what carbon impact that would have, but also, what does that mean in terms of what you need to do from a manufacturing or production perspective? So Matt's been waiting very patiently by my side to talk about transforming timber. <laughs> and, and that's where we're moving on to next as, as part of this, this landscape. Uh, because Mark, Matt and his team's hard work and effort over the last number of weeks, the assets are actually uh, behind us. So what I'll do is I'll hand to Matt now to explain some of the sort of innovation and commercialization approaches that have been taking place and perhaps explain some of the, the products and systems that we can, we can see. Sure. Matt. Th thanks, Robert. Um, yeah, I, th I think we can all agree on the points that Robert's uh, gone through there, the, you know, the drivers, the reasons to do stuff. But how do you actually unlock that? How do you get that from, you know, really compelling concept to actually something deliverable and something that can, on the back of that, be commercialized? Um, and within that uh, graphic which Robert showed, um, there's the commercial accelerator role, which, which uh, as ecosystems technologies, we adopt. So. What that entails is, you know, actually grabbing, grabbing the, 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 the concept and running with it, trying to get the really rich uh, research and development uh, and catalyze that through delivering it into live projects. Um, so I can walk, walk, uh, walk us through some, uh, the journey that we've been on really since the end of last year. It's uh, um, in November, December last year, uh, we manufactured the... Uh, the structural shell of the uh, Synergy demonstrator, the transforming timber demonstrator, which is behind us there. Um, so uh, the, uh, the, 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 the demonstrator is a two-bed duplex for Synergy, who you should visit and uh, find out more about the, uh, the, um, the new way of living that uh, can be provided through, through the work that Synergy are doing and the transformative impact that they can have on, uh, on energy systems and community energy uh, approach. Um, when, we, when we delivered the, uh, that, that dem demonstrator, we chose not just to go for the production of cross-laminated timber as an output, N not that that wouldn't have been ambitious enough, but this, this is a piece of project work is about actually setting our goals beyond just the, 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 the sort of immediate uh, deliverables to what the long-term implications can be for biogenic offsite manufacturing. So the, the unit that you can see uh, has cross-laminated timber walls, glue laminated timber floors, nail laminated timber roof, uh, ceilings and roof panels. Um, and the nail lam uses lignolock nails, which is a beach nail, so it's you know, genuinely uh, uh, you know, wood-first approach, albeit it's imported beach, I'm afraid, so uh, we made a small concession there. Um, the, uh, and, and in the build-up uh, beyond that as well, we're looking at you know, how, how can we make sure that the remainder of the external fabric is, is, uh, is uh, wood fibre rich. So uh, the, the wood fibre e external insulation uh, is, uh, is, is, is relatively known and, and tri trialled. We've been using that for years, but in the roof construction, we've got uh, a combination of 120 mil of wood fibre insulation topped with 125, 120 mil of cork. And that's allowed us to, uh, to have a, 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 
a, a, war, a warm roof build-up. So immediately onto that, we have a TPO single ply roof membrane. This is a system developed by Suprema, and this is the first time it's used in the UK. We've actually got a project on site already for Fetis College, which deploys that. And Scott, who's doing his PhD in digital twin, twinning and, uh, sen dig and censoring, uh, has got sensors already applied within that, that construction. So we can start to really early monitor and see how performance on, on site and in situ relates to the actual design performance. And typically, we've, uh, we, uh, we tend to get better results uh, in use than in design, which is rare, of course, uh, in construction industry, but can be expected with uh, an off-site approach. Um, so that gave us a really early platform to say, we can dry the homegrown resource down to 12% moisture content. And that can be done at commercial scale. So BSW Timber have done a phenomenal uh, job of demonstrating that that can be done without loss of yield. Uh, Dave Mills and his team at uh, Boater Garden have brought real expertise in timber drying to, to de demonstrate that. So on the basis of that, you know, we can look at this being a genuine commercial uh, proposition. So roll forwards, you know, the, the other projects which we have uh, on, uh, exhibited here, we've got the near home solution. So uh, Transport Scotland, uh, funded by a Scottish government and provided that funding to Construction Scotland Innovation Centre to, to deliver a near to home working solution. So we picked up uh, the opportunity to be lead designer on that and deploy some of the timber innovation that we've done on the Synergy Demonstrator into that, so we developed a glue laminated timber portal that uh, is a very efficient use of, uh, it's like a hybrid between cross lam and glue laminated timber solution. And uh, Andrew Livingston and his team at Napier uh, took that round with it and we've created computational mathematics that, uh, that means that we've got a, 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 a uh, we can, we can uh, have a configuration tool which allows us to deliver to various solutions. I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to try and rattle through uh, more than I'm doing so far. But that, we've now sort of taken that and run with it, and we have a, a design tool, an app that can, can be used as an, on an open source basis so that individuals can design their own system, and that can immediately uh, be, be done through a, um, uh, through a configuration tool. So actually this this allows for the scale it allows for that to be scaled beyond you know individuals having to do the design piece so uh, take a look at that take a look at the app and uh, and hopefully I'll en enjoy seeing that uh, and then as a as a massive crescendo in the run up to uh, to this event uh, we've we've been uh, fortunate enough to deliver the uh, the gen zero uh, schools prototype and that's working with uk government's department for education and that is a really exciting prospect because it, this project is about more than creating commodities. It's about creating solutions. It's about creating systems. And it's, created, and it's bringing those together in a way that then can be rolled out at scale but with, with meaning and purpose. And, you know, we, need, we, have, we have all those ingredients of the technical capability, the, the natural resource. Um, and deploying that in a project like the Gen Zero project is, you know, phenomenally exciting. Um, to see that come together and to see the massive uh, mass timber sections uh, become a reality and to see, it was great to see Sam's presentation earlier that sort of overlaid the actual uh, built unit against the, uh, the concept is uh, just phenomenally exciting. So we, uh, we, we think we're in rude health to push forward from this. So uh, Robert, better take the mic back because otherwise I'll keep talking. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm known for that myself right now, so that's okay. Um, so yeah, I think one of the really interesting pieces around this is if we were simply doing our research in isolation and not engaging with, with likes of what Matt's doing at Ecosystems and, and having the interventions from, from the Construction Scotland Innovation Centre uh, and, and also thinking about this from an educational standpoint, if we were looking at those things in isolation, then we wouldn't get... the the scale of the impact that we need. So it's, it's really about the, the isolated parts coming together in, in combination or in concert to affect change at, at scale. And, and, you know, that was a slide from our original sort of pitch presentation and things have moved on since then. But essentially what we were looking at was, you know, as I say, 
how we can take the work that we're doing, embed it into the digital models, but equally have a series of lives, live assets uh, that come into reality. And from those live assets, um, I, I don't, as those projects become live, take the measurements and monitor, and monitor the situation as much as possible and capture that into the digital model so that we can look to uh, further optimization and equally uh, create the information so that you can, you can make a more discernible uh, business case, right? And you can, in, you can inform that judgment. Uh, so, so in that point of view, it's, it's not just about uh, it cost X, because part, part of the issue sometimes is, well, you know, is timber, can timber compete on cost? And it's like, well, what's the cost of our children not having a future, right? So it's about saying, what is the actual cost that we need to consider in making that information as transparent as possible? So it may cost more, but ultimately, its whole life cost is, is far better. Or it may cost the same, or it may cost cheaper if you get the right level of optimization. But it's how you collate that information and present it in a, in a manner where you can affect uh, the decision-making process. So that's why the, the, the living lab piece of this, for me, is, is, is very important. And just to move forward into the sort of education piece, um, what we need to do is, is capture this content to improve the, that decision-making process, but equally how we can use that for, for the education of built environment professionals of, of the future. And that's where the, the, the NMITE role that I've taken on comes into play and the opportunity that presents itself through that, because NMITE is a startup higher education institute, so at, at present it doesn't have all the, the internal bureaucracy uh, and administration processes of a traditional university. So that offers, offers up an opportunity to, to do something and create something different in terms of that educational approach. And therefore, uh, present timber as something that is squarely in the, the 22nd century, uh, you know, in terms of a new model of, of educational delivery. So not about lectures, but about challenge-based learning and indeed, Ideally, those learners have been part of actual delivery of live projects, which is a lot of the work that we've done in the past through the likes of the, the built environment exchange process. And look at how we can create an educational system, which, you know, at its heart, will still have to have the, the, rel the relevant levels of quality assurance, etc., associated with it. But fundamentally, it becomes an educational system, so it's consistently up updated and refreshed through uh, live projects, etc. Um, so in that regard, we have, we've done some work uh, in, in terms of creating a, a competency framework to respond to this in terms of what does the, uh, what do the, what does the educational requirements of the sector, uh, and, and of course that has a lot more granulation to it, which we don't have time to go through. And then the Cat Living Lab building, which is going up in, in Hereford, will be part of the, the Living Lab approach. And ideally in the future we can get to a position where these timbers, where these buildings are, are manufactured through uh, a fully timber-based approach also. So with that, I'll thank you very much for your time uh, and we'll hand over for Q&A, I'm sure. I hope you're all similarly aghast to me. There is just so much new knowledge, there's new development, uh, expertise, and I think, if it's even possible, a whole renewed enthusiasm around this uh, transforming uh, timber program, so it's been good, in, uh, good money from Innovate UK, well spent so far. So, over to the floor. Do we have questions for Robert and Matt? David? Um, I have a more general one. Um, I'm aware that there's a lot of specialists in the room here today, but uh, citizens in Scotland um, are still very conservative. As a, st uh, a colleague from Stuart Milne uh, spoke about everybody wanting brick <laughs> around their houses and things like this. Um, and, and it's a question I almost asked of Andy in front of me, um, was how do we get the change of attitude for forestry, for commercial forestry, um, uh, to uh, accelerate at the sp same speed that we've got for recreational woodland. Um, because at the moment, the public are up for lots of woodland. We, we've heard that there's got to be lots of planting, and this, this idea we're going to be a natural regeneration, blah, blah, blah. So how can we um, move the dial on um, public and decision makers um, and landowners 
um, perspective on on um, uh, on on how we might achieve those acreage those a those acreages to to fill up that that gap in 2045 or to, whenever it's going you know because it, it was quite a a worrying dip down um, uh, after so um, th th this is, this is for specialists. How uh, about the public public awareness thing and, and the and the pol political lobbying? How's that going? In terms, so uh, the political, the public awareness. So how are we getting information out there is the question, or, or sorry, I'm struggling with the question. Well, actually, well, I mean, I, I think it's interesting. You said that you know people are conservative; they want you know they're used to and want brick. I think that's what we te that's what they are told that they want as well. So you know, I think. I've not met somebody yet who didn't uh, step into one of these units and find it thoroughly aspirational and something that they would want to have for themselves. So I don't think there's, that people are going, oh God, that's not for me. It's this, you can't choose what you can't see, can you? So, I th I th so and that's, that's the job that we have to do, is to, is to make this uh, a mainstream uh, alternative to people. And I think as we do that, it will be adopted and I think that will drive drive that change or be part of how to drive that change um i'll let you talk about the political bit yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not politics man i was going to pass the microphone to andy to be honest do you, do you want the microphone do you want to answer that question yeah yeah well, well one of the things in in forestry that um we suffer from is is policy change now when i <laughs> Those 35 years ago, when I started there, 40 years ago, it was policy to plough and plant everything. And I mean everything. And uh, Sitka spruce was a species, so that's what you did. Um, unfortunately, it takes 40, 50 years before those plantations disappear. And that's what people recognise about forestry. Now, 25 years ago, the policy changed rightly. Uh, so where a modern forest um, design You've only got 50% spruce. You've got 15% open land. You've got other conifers, and you've got broadleaves, and you've got water. Um, but it takes 20, 30 years for people to see that, and it's still coming through. So unfortunately, in people's minds, it's still about, you hear monoculture, you hear wall-to-wall -wall trees. Um, and, and yes, that was what we did. That's what I was paid to do. But that's changed, and we have to get that across coupled with making people make the link with those trees and these fantastic buildings and what they bring. And, 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 but it takes time, and we're at it all the time. But, uh, and again, cutting trees down, that sort of thing. Uh, explaining to people when you, do, you, you grow forestry sustainably, that's a good thing. You cut a tree down because we're planting it again. We're storing all that carbon, we're sucking more out. Uh, unfortunately, that gets a bit confused with cutting down the Amazon and, and, and native and natural forests, which we're not that keen on ourselves. Thank you. Danielle has another question just over here, and one at the back from Rory. Yeah, down here. Come, come All right, back. okay. Oh. Hello, uh, Rory. Um, Good talk. Uh, that was really good. Um, I like how you moved on from like all the innovative stuff you're doing into the competency framework. But uh, in terms of that stuff, I can see you're both young lads, um, really pulling it off. Um, do you think it's harder to apply that competency framework to the older generation of the sector compared to the young? And how would that be done going forward? Thanks for the question, Rory. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, um, no. It's a good. It's a good point. So. Yeah, we kind of whistled through that about the presentation, but um, yeah, what the tactic we've obviously taken in developing that comms framework is, is with the sector um, and, and all the, you know, what do we need from the, sort of, you know, timber engineering, but uh, we've got to be careful when we say timber engineering because everyone's brain navigates to sort of structural timber engineering. But it's much, it's much broader than that, right? And you know that landscape in terms of what we need to do and and, up, and upskill because there's a, a vast array of, of of what that needs to be done to educate across. You know, how do you cost? How do you do the cost bit? Or how, what's the acoustics, the thermal performance, structural performance, uh, the the health and safety on site? So there's a, a broad spectrum within that. Um, so how we are looking to to do this is, is to create the the competency framework of 
what do we see as being the, the core competencies that are needed and also what cuts across within that and, the, and then tailor the educational content to, to meet with that, with that need uh, and do this in what's been called, uh, what's known as a micro-credential, micro-credentials. Uh, so essentially it's, it's sort of, um, uh, you know, bite-sized information uh, so that, that that content is set up so that people can navigate their, their way through it. Um, what we need to do is therefore distill available information and make it palatable to, to the respective audiences such that they can therefore engage with it and, I, and have that information hosted uh, in the cloud so that people can access it from anywhere. Um, and then what we want them to do is, they, is go, to, uh, go to a facility, whether that be here uh, or whether that be uh, CAT in Hereford, where they would undertake what the challenge-based uh, learning activity so they can demonstrate the knowledge that they've, they've ascer ascertained. So there's this piece of, you know, to use Matt's expression of the, the democratization of the information. We also need to unlock some of the content that's, that, that's, that's there and, and, and get it out and provide uh, the learners with an educational system that they can work through and then demonstrate that they've acquired that knowledge. Um, and my, my ideal with this also is that, um, you know, because people were going through it at different, potentially at different rates but on a flexible basis, that you would actually be able to bring learners together that are possibly at different points in the curve, and therefore they can, sh they, uh, and also uh, looking at a, a different career pathway. So they, there's almost like an inherent mentorship piece within that, uh, and, and therefore help, help, that helps with the, the educational piece also. So, um, so it, also, it, it, also, it almost um, it makes it more palatable uh, and, and, and makes people want to, to engage with it. So there's no fear factor, I think, is what I'm looking for. So people aren't, they aren't frightened of going back to do that, that reskilling piece. Mm. Yeah, and I think, if, if, if I may, you know, in terms of, you know, how do we tackle, if you want, if you want to stigmatise uh, that older generation worry, um, how, do we, uh, how, how do we tackle that? Well, it, it's, it's yourself that, uh, you know, if we, if we do our job well, and the best part, uh, you know, one of the best parts and the privilege of the role that we do is, is about inspiring the next generation. You know, and look here, you know, we've got yourself as a shining example of that, and, and then the, sort of the, the, the next, uh, next folk coming through with Louise next year, and uh, Hugo a few rows in front, Lauren uh, a bit in front of that, and uh, Scott at the back. You guys are coming through, you know, working with us, working, you know, gaining that, that real empowerment and confidence uh, and competency around sustainability and use of timber. Well, you know, it's you guys that will, that will go out into the industry and actually force that change um, because you'll demand it. We were having uh, just, you know, workshop session uh, just before this and it was a point that Andrew Ward made was that, you know, they're constantly getting asked to go and speak in, in, at universities. Uh, and he said they're, they're, they're told that they're getting asked because that it's being demanded by the students, you know. So that, that demand for a different approach and for a more, you know, for a fresher approach is coming from the students and those students then become early, early career professionals. So that's where the pool will be and be able, you'll be able to step into those roles and say there is an alternative and this is what it looks like and this is why we should do it. So uh, I think looking out in the audience, I think we've got it covered, hopefully. <laughs> Thanks. I'm, I'm just going to be, be disruptive and go back one step and just build on what Andy said. I think one of the ways is we need to get more forest managers to visit places like this. Yeah. And we need to get, we, we do need to educate the general public, but we've got forest managers trying to do um, community engagement events and talking about new woodland creation and um, people's perception of what we can use Sitka spruce for is, is very limited. And if we could, if we had more forest managers coming here being inspired by you guys, seeing what, these, seeing what we can build, then I think that would be much more palatable and it would enable people to understand why we need to massively expand our forests. Because otherwise, their, their perception of, if all they t people ever see is a timber truck disappearing, then they, they have no idea what that's used for. So mm -hmm. I think places like this and places like Stevens Craft or Boater Garden, mm -hmm. these are just amazing kind of, um, I was gonna say, sorry, they're almost, I was going to use the word embassy, but they're, sort of, they're ambassadors for, for the forest industry. So I think that sort of greater openness and sort of promoting what Comfort does and what you guys mm -hmm. do, but just 
trying to trying to bridge that gap between timber that we all use and live and want to live in and as you say you walk into these buildings you go wow and you go can we build can we grow this stuff mm -hmm. and that's there's a huge gap in people's understanding and perception so more foresters dragged here please mm -hmm. uh, yeah wholeheartedly agree and we, we, we're seeing increasing num increasingly those sort of conversations happening and and you know also you know likes of highlands and islands enterprise i think you know Coming to the realization that these aren't these aren't distinct sectors. They're you know there's, uh, there's, they're, they're connected, and I guess the industry leadership groups are addressing that really really sort of positively. So. Yeah, I think yeah. You know, I was just going to say I think it's really interesting what you've said, but that perception piece is is, is really key, isn't it? I mean, for a long time we we've been told consistently you can't do this. Consistent, and even, even when it, people are stood in here, it, seeing yeah, the finished product, told it won't work. It's, but it's when it's manifest, it's, yeah, exactly. the perception piece is a powerful barrier. Yeah, yeah totally. And so it's you know, as you say, we, we almost need to, to bring them here to, to show them or take it to them to say yes, we can absolutely do this, and now we need to do it because we've got a climate crisis, and we need to use a local resource and add value to it. But yeah, the, the level of scepticism is is ridiculous. Yeah. Yes, could I just maybe comment on a couple of points about the, the older generation that have not been receptive to change. And can I say that I've been in the front line of construction for uh, nearly about 50 years. And, uh, I've had, and that's been building office blocks, hospitals, all types of constructions. And one of the earlier points that was made in the slide uh, was referred to... Um, traditional build of houses. And I was speaking to my colleague here. I, can, I don't know what the traditional build of house is at the present moment in time, because it has constantly changed. And it has been changing over the last 30, 40 years. And the, the change, the people at the front line just have accepted the changes and got on with the changes, because we realise that what we're doing at the moment is not correct. So you'll probably discover that the older generation know that what we're doing is not right and they'll make the change. One of the biggest changes that I have seen, especially in the uh, industrial uh, buildings over the last years, uh, was that when I started, it used to have big, huge boiler houses put in at the bottom of, of, of the, the buildings. Huge boiler houses put in at Pipeworks, but that has changed over the years. We've now got small boiler houses and loads and loads of insulation coming into them. Mm -hmm. So there has been a lot of change. Personally, I was, old, I was classified as a concrete specialist. And the, the technology in construction in concrete over the last, I would say, 20, 30 years has been actually quite remarkable. For they've been using that for thermal mass and they've been using it for that. So, there, it's not as if timber, it's not as if concrete and steelwork have actually been sitting and doing nothing for the last 40, 50 years. They have been, they have been moving as well. So I think you're correct. What you need to do is get these good examples of timber and get them out there and get them shown to get, to get the change made on it. And I think that will come. Uh, and I think it will be a lot easier than what you're anticipating as well. That's great, thank you. Yeah, well, let's let's hope so, right? But I think, um, yeah, I think there's a, there's a yeah, in terms of a tr traditional build model. I think obviously there's a whole timber platform frame piece, and but down in England, the, the traditional build is viewed as more sort of brick and block, etc. And, and much of that obviously needs to change. But equally, as much as we have a traditional timber platform frame construction, it's primarily open panel con construction that's going to site and then getting a, a, a block veneer put around it and, and a, a, render, a, a, a render finish um, because of curbside appeal, because that's what people seemingly want to, to see uh, and often don't even know that they're, they're in a, a, a timber built system. Uh, so there's, there's a, again, that's coming back to that perception piece. Um, but equally, I think that in terms of traditional build, it's not just about the fabric of, of, of the system uh, and, and how it's been built. I think the traditional procurement and business model piece needs to change, particularly if we want to do this. 
uh, scale because we have to think I just, we have to think completely differently about it in terms of it has to be, the thought process has to be on whole life cost rather than the sort of capital un, upfront cost and then people worrying about the energy bills thereafter. Uh, you know, we've just had the whole gas crisis piece, right? So I think there's I think that the the, the, the traditional bit about it is is about the how the building's uh, built and delivered and, and changing that through these alternative systems, uh, but equally that, that traditional uh, business model of procurement approach. Scott? One of the things we asked the uh, communities in the for tropical forest was, um, what would a 16-year-old think of all this? We were asking about forest management, but I think it's an equally relevant question to sort of think about. You guys are talking about culture change, and it's so evident that it's culture change within the industry, but it's also the customer, the consumer. Um, and what you're doing here is creating these great um, icons for people to look at, um, to, to, to see, to see out in the world, to see in these laboratories. So I think, you know, getting the youth involved we actually created a community of practice called the Future of Forest Work in Communities for Young People. Um, I think you're doing stuff like that, but just however much more you can, you can um, sort of pour on the steam for uh, young people to see this, to imagine a future where, hey, that's a really cool job. I don't know if the word cool is as resonant here, but you know, in sort of a Canadian context, it's like, what would young people think is cool to do? And if they come and see this, they're gonna say, that is cool. I could actually imagine doing that. And that's just, you know, one of the many ways that the work you're doing is driving a culture change. And I've been, as you all have probably, some of you have seen Matt working, I've been watching him working, <laughs> and it's just amazing. Like, I'd like to get dozens of young people here watching him work and say, that is really awesome. Um, I would like to mentor, I would like to learn, and, and that's just building the skills and the knowledge that it's gonna take. So I just want to congratulate I'm, you. I'm glad to say, Scott, you've got one, two, three, four, five of our, I think, built environment change makers just right in front of you there. Mm -hmm. You're part of our network at CSIC of uh, young professionals in construction who are here to make a difference. And the Bex program through Napier that Robert developed and launched is very much an exchange program uh, at a master's level to get uh, Cross fertilization of knowledge across continents uh, and uh, across courses. And on Thursday, we're delighted to be welcoming the Construction Leadership mm -hmm. Council's young professionals uh, here as well to see uh, to see the setup and hopefully to meet the built environment change makers too. Yeah. And and if I may, Lucy, we're going to mm -hmm. have uh, there's a fantastic uh, school curriculum program, design, engineer, construct, and uh, uh, some some of the uh, students from one of the schools are going to be coming in uh, during the course of, uh, of 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 the event as well uh, to visit. So yeah, the the value of that is imme is immense. Okay, right, well, I think that is us uh, almost run out of steam and energy to keep warm. So, big clap to our speakers. So, we've heard lots this afternoon, well, not just this afternoon, today. Um, this morning at the Wood for Good conference, I'm sure as well in the Transforming Timber workshop. Lots to tantalise your timber, bur timber buds. Um, and now it's your chance to get a real taste of these projects through doing some tours within the factory if you've not already uh, been to visit the exhibits. So I hope as many of you as possible can stay on to do one of the more formal tours, which are going to be led by our team, Sam Hart and Jennifer Smart, who are at the front here. So if I can ask those that are going to stay behind to do a tour to gather just at the factory entrance, just around the other side of the yellow block, um, for those that are not going to join an official tour, you can have a wander around. The Wood Miser is still doing a demonstration outside in the yard, so please um, go and view that. And I think, although not many of them are left, I don't think, but what I would really like to do is to thank all the fantastic speakers that we've had today, both in the Wood for Good programme and the Transforming uh, timber workshop this morning. There's been lots of different facets, lots of different input and a lot of inspiration. And I think that's all been really demonstrated by the many, many, many questions that we've had from the floor. So thank you all too for being a really great audience uh, in both sessions. And I hope we'll see you back soon. And I hope you'll get onto social media and share a lot of this as well. <laughs> okay, thank you.